All righty, guys. Uh, we are lucky, lucky, lucky because uh, I have been trying to set this up for a while. And of course, uh, as y'all know, I had extensive computer issues for quite some time. So uh, it, it, it's great. We've uh, finally got our guest that we've got tonight. Uh, tonight, we are joined by one of my favorite people, uh, just an outstanding guy, a kind man, and one heck of a recon man, um, Mr. Joe Morris. He was a <clears throat> Special Forces Green Beret. He was at CCC. Um, he was with 6th Group uh, as well as 5th Group. Went to Vietnam, as I said, to CCC. Was with RT Florida and was with RT Hawaii. Um, he did do a little bit of some other work uh, after his field experience with RT Hawaii. But we'll let our guests get into that. But without further ado, I'm going to pass it over to our guest tonight, Mr. Joe Morris. Mr. Joe, thank you for joining us. And the floor is yours. Hey, bud. Thanks for having me. And I, I hope I don't disappoint you tonight because I'm not as uh, uh, as valiant or as, as you might uh, suggest that I am. But I got my start in the military by my dad, who was a what we called a lifer back then. My dad was in for 25 years. I was born on an army base, Fort George G. Meade, Maryland. And as a kid, we, you know, we moved every three years. And at one point we lived in Germany a lot longer than we lived in any one place in the US. So um, by the time uh, um, I graduated high school, my dad had kicked me out of the house for having long hair, which it wasn't very long back in those days with no direction, I joined the army. And that's how I got into the army. All righty. Um, we were actually having a, uh, a, a good little conversation on what we were gonna, how the show was gonna be going. And uh, we're looking at some pictures that, that brought up some, some good, uh, good memories. Um, can you speak a little bit first about, um, well, most people are actually curious. Where did you end up going uh, through basic training and and all of that? Yeah, uh, basic training was at Fort Jackson, South Carolina. Ooh. And uh, um, while there, uh, and this is the honest guy, and I'm getting ready to tell you things that you you probably won't believe, but the whole series of events is the honest to God's truth. Um, while in basic you know, they came, some guy came and he'd looking all, all strack and stuff. And uh, uh, he was looking for people to, to join, volunteer for Airborne. And this one guy standing next to me says, hey man, let's do that. And I looked at him and before I said anything, I knew that he was as much of a wimp as I was. So I couldn't see him going, but I said, okay. So we volunteered for, for jump school. That being said, after I graduated basic, I went to uh, um, Fort Leonard Wood in Missouri for my AIT, which was engineering, combat engineering. And they taught us how to build a, a 10 by 10 command centers, so to speak. But while I was there, uh, I got uh, my orders, because I was wondering where I was going to be sent, but I got orders to go to Benning for jump school. And I had forgotten completely that I had volunteered for jump school. So, uh, so I ended up going to jump school. And while in jump school, and this is the God's honest truth, this guy, a Green Beret, comes to the, to the uh, formation, and he's asking people to volunteer for the Green Berets. And I knew, hell, I'm not going to do that. But my buddy, who was a good man, actually, Hester, his last name was Hester. Uh, he said, well, let's, let's volunteer for that. And I, I it's like, like, just like before I said, okay, uh, let's do that. And, um, unfortunately he had had, uh, some, as a young man, I had, had, you know, gotten in trouble with the law and, uh, uh, so they wouldn't take him, but they took my sorry ass. And, uh, um, so that's how I got into going into the Green Berets, that, that right there. I wasn't like a lot of people, like I discovered later on, that a lot of these men I met, they were dedicated. 
they were really, really into wanting to do something for their country. I really had no concept of that or any idea that I was going to be fighting for my country, anything like that. I just went in probably the worst way possible, just not even knowing what I was getting my butt into, and uh, uh, and no really high uh, high um, level of uh, um, of you know honor or anything like that. Oh, what, what, do you remember uh, the the year that you got through with uh, basic AIT <clears throat> and jump at yeah, Benning, and when you got uh, to uh, end up at Fort Bragg and began training group? Uh, I got the um, I went in the army in August of sixty seven, and uh, got through with AIT just before December, right around December of sixty seven. So I got to go home for thirty days. And after that 30 days, uh, uh, January of 68, went to uh, Fort Benning. So it was like the first three weeks of January, and it was cold. Let me tell you, it was cold there. And, and, I'm, and I'm basically from Ohio, so I knew what cold was, but it was cold there too <laughs> in January, out there running everywhere you go, you know. But I don't know how I made it through it, but I made it through it. What was your, uh, excuse me, when you were in a uh, training group, what, what was your uh, uh, MOS? What were you, what were you trained as? Okay. I went to a, a training group, like I say, uh, I got there just in, at the end of January of 68. And uh, um, let's see, what was my MOS? Um Oh, O5B, radio operator. <laughs> Can't believe it. Uh, you know, did odd or did. Um, and uh, um, the Army was looking at a program that uh, uh, instead of sitting through uh, eight hours of da da, alpha, da da, alpha, they had this program called the Judson E. Cornish program. And what it was is that learning a, a Morse code through word association. So, like, Instead of hearing da da alpha, you heard da da along the word along, you know, and it and the uh, da da's would be the, the word along would be real loud, and the da da would be real low until it just increasingly changed where the da da became louder, but you heard along, like B was break cylinder. I couldn't tell you what that dot did that uh, is now, 50 years later, but C was Carolina, D was Delta, E was Echo, you know, that kind of thing. Or Ed, I forget. It's been so long. But anyway, it's word association, and the Army never really bought it, and probably good reason, because I can't even remember it now. <laughs> you, did you have any guys that you would uh, go on to? To, to serve with uh, in, in training group with you? Yeah, uh, a friend of mine, a guy named, uh, oh God, I can't think of his last name right now, but his name was Jim. But he introduced me to this guy who I thought was a pretty cool guy, a guy named Glenn Yuramura. And uh, um, we had actually gone through jump school at the same time, but didn't even know each other then. But I met Glenn, we were both in Company B of training group. And uh, uh, of course, yeah, years later, you know, I ran it not a lot, that many years later, but in 69, I ran into Glenn there at the, uh, at the Contum at CCC and eventually ran that mission with him. That is so neat. That's uh. <clears throat> that and, and we'll uh guys later on we'll be getting into a story uh, uh with with joe and M mr glenn uh sadly glenn's no longer with us um but guys if you're wondering um this is actually a photo of rt vermont with um franklin doug miller medal of honor uh earned the medal of honor chuck Kahn, sadly who uh they lost uh during a uh freak accident with a white phosphorus grenade and of course uh major plaster over there and i believe uh glenn and uh 
major plast or strap hanging on, on this mission. I, I'm not 100% sure, but I believe that's the story on that. But uh, if I'm not mistaken, also, did you not have the uh, the wild man and uh, future 1-0 award winner, Mr. Mike, the werewolf shepherd with you? No, I was never. Uh, Mike, uh, I met Mike in training group also. And then uh, after I had been, uh, and after I had left the recon teams and started doing combo, Mike came to Contum, and uh, and uh, I tried to befriend him, but uh, I don't think he either didn't remember me or you know. Uh, but uh, but he was a wild man with a good description for him. He, uh, he very close with his yards, a, uh, from all accounts, a very, uh, very tough man. Um, I've, I've heard some stories of him, uh, defending his, his mountain yards who were, uh, let, let, let's just say being abused. Um, and I've heard he, uh, took the, uh, took cowardice very serious. Uh, he, he confronted a, uh, uh, a Green Beret captain, if I'm not mistaken, at Doc Siang one afternoon when a helicopter crashed. And uh, he, yeah, <laughs> needless to say, he is quite the guy. He's uh, he's still alive. He's still with us. And uh, he, he's quite the guy, like uh, Mr. Joe said. Uh, to this day, I remember a story that Mike told us in training group. And I know he was, you know, being funny, but it describes him completely. He says, he told us that did you ever hear about that part in the Bible where the Philistines uh, or some guy gets beaten up and a, a good Samaritan comes on and, and helps the guy out? And we all say, yeah, yeah. And he says, well, I was the guy, one of the guys that beat his ass up. <laughs> I remember you telling me that story. And I said, that sounds exactly like Mike Shepard. <clears throat> what a guy. What a guy. Um, yeah. wow. So, I mean, if, if Mr. Glenn was in your training group, that means, um, around that time, uh, we could, Bob Beck told Terry Cadenback, uh, both of them were with Glenn, Mr. Glenn at one, one point in time in training group. Uh, those names are familiar, but I don't really know them, but I know I've heard the name, especially Bob Bertold. Yeah, no, the big, the, the redhead. Yeah, the wild redhead. <laughs> um, Terry actually, uh, he's been on, he, he's been on quite a few times and he is, uh, he was at CCC with you, but he was <clears throat> over at the Hatchet Forces. Oh, okay. So, mm -hmm. okay. Um, so you're, uh, you've gotten trained, you're, you're, you graduate, I should say, uh, and, are you uh what's going to go on next are you looking to go to an a team are you uh what are you thinking well, now we go to i go to after i graduate in special forces training group um i go stationed with the six on the uh signal signal company uh -huh. and uh, uh i'm there probably six months you know from july to about december when uh, I, just before this, that December, I got my orders for Vietnam. And I didn't really volunteer for Vietnam, but, and I'm pretty sure this is a true story, but back in those days, there was, these guys had a phone number of some lady in DC that they could call her up. And uh, they, could, they would volunteer to go to Vietnam. She put, put my name on the list. Well, those guys put my name on the list without asking me, which was fine. Um, you know, because I figured I'd be going anyway, but it, that's just how I ended up going because they, they volunteered my name because Joe, sure, you want to go. <laughs> so, wow. So, so the guys actually volunteered your name with Mrs. A and she ended up getting all of y'all in. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. That, that's actually <laughs> one of the, the, the more wild Miss A's, uh, stories that we've heard because, Everybody, uh, of course, that, that we've spoken with, or I should say 90% of the guys have uh, mentioned uh, 
calling her or hearing rumors of this this lady that can do anything uh, at the Pentagon. And uh, <laughs> wow, your, your buddies went ahead and uh, offered your name up and said, uh, put him on the list as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, and they were great guys. Uh, uh, one of the guys' last name is Brim, B-R-E-H-M, I think, or something like that. But he was a good guy, John Brim. Uh, yeah, yeah. Was, like I said, I didn't mind it because I, I knew I was destined to go there anyway. So uh, I, I, I imagine it's pretty quick from, from that point on. Do you uh, – do you know beforehand what your jobs, where you're going to go, or is no, it Vietnam no. when you? Um, when we got there, I, I I don't think we're not even too far from the tarmac. You know, just landed, and there's a bunch of us milling around, and there's this old first sergeant talking to us and everything, and he's going to say, "Boys, I'm looking for somebody who wants to volunteer and do something for us." I can't tell you what it is, but I can tell you this. After you do it for six months, if you don't want to do it no more, you don't have to. And Ron Gravett turns to me, and we, I had just met him, you know, like two hours before or something like that. He said, well, let's go do that, man. And I said, okay. So everything I did in the military was like, hey, Joe, let's do this. And I just say, okay, without even thinking about the consequences of where I was even going. Yeah, that's Ron. I understand he's passed also. Sadly, we he he has we I believe uh, two or three years ago. Yes, sir. Right, right as COVID started, I believe. Well, yes, sir. Very very sad. Thought, the very first week we got to a CCC, he got put on the mic force, I think, and uh, uh, when I got shot up, got got some shrapnel on the side of his head, not very deep at all, just a flesh wound. And got his uh, purple heart. <laughs> CIB and purple heart right off the bat. CIB and purple heart, yeah. <laughs> I, th I think I've actually got uh, photos of, of him bandaged up and boogered up. Uh, I'll, I'll have to see if I can find that while we're talking. But uh, I've actually got uh, – he was the first one I saw in these. Uh, again, guys, if y'all don't have them, uh, Y'all need to uh, pick up the, these uh, wonderful books uh, for for history and preservation sakes, Jason's books. But uh, he he was the first one I saw with the uh, war medallion, and I ended up uh, getting a, a recreation. Not not gold, of course. I, I didn't have that kind of money, but uh, once I saw that, I was like, wow, that is the coolest now, thing I've ever was seen. That? Was that the one that said war, or was that the B fifty two? That was the the regular war one. He does have a okay. B fifty two one too, though. Also, that one's looks awesome. Like the, looks like the uh, the peace symbol, but when you take a closer look at it, it's a B fifty two. <laughs> yes, sir. I had and that I one for a while. Okay, <laughs> wow. I uh, I and, and there's some kind of cool writing, or it, it may have been customized, but I know uh, some of the guys uh, ha had something on it. John Plaster had one that was engraved, and I for the life of me, can't remember what it was, but it was something quite funny. Uh, uh, y'all had some really good, uh, really good medallions and all of that. Y'all, uh, thought up and got made. Y'all were on the cutting edge of everything. <laughs> um, so when you and, uh, or I should say when Ron volunteers y'all for, uh, SOG, uh, he ends up of course at CCC. Uh, do y'all know pretty much immediately, uh, where y'all are going? Do y'all get a briefing beforehand, or y'all go, go uh, sent down to well, content? What I, what I remember is like as soon as I got there, they sexually sent us down to uh, uh, Hontre Island. Oh, okay. For orient to get oriented, so to combat speak, you know? orientation course. Yeah, and, and weather wise and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. I guess you know, um, but yeah, and then. Uh, I think I was assigned to Team Florida, though, before I went down there, but I couldn't be positive. I, and I might have done Hontre Island even before I went to Contium. I just really, to be honest with you, I can't really remember. But I think I went to CCC first and then to uh, uh, then to Hontre Island. Uh, weren't you uh, at COC or uh, where were you uh, hanging out with, with Dave Maurer? Uh Oh, okay. That was a. Uh, um, I think that was part of that. That okay. was part of that. Davy Maurer. 
Yes. Uh, we were, uh, we, like, I guess we had a few beers or something, but we ended up, you know, rappelling off the uh, a 30 foot tower thing there, you know, in our underwear. You know? mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And making noise and shit like that. But I think, uh, if I'm not mistaken, he might have come out with his uh, M16 or something. I don't think we had cars at that time, but, you know, let out a b- burst of six, you know what I mean, from, from the air. And, uh, you know, the story is that, you know, some major captain uh, uh, called him to the, you know, to his death the next day. And the uh, uh, the rumor was that Davy said, sir, the only thing between you and me is fear and atmosphere. <laughs> <laughs> God, I love Dave. He is, he, he is quite the character. Guys, yeah, that's Dave what, right there. The, uh, I call them the leg officers and stuff like that. They, they couldn't do anything to us, you know what I mean? We were off limits to them, you know? Fear and atmosphere. You gotta love that. That's something right <laughs> out of a Vietnam movie right there. <laughs> uh, so, like, wow. Yeah, I don't know if it's true, but it's all, I've always heard that, you know? <laughs> so, after uh, after all that is is taking place, are, are you, you think, or, or you, at, at some point in time thereafter, or maybe even before, you're uh, already, you know for a fact, you're going to be on RT, uh, RT Florida, I should say. Right, right. And, the, you know, the first person I meet is Ken Workley. Um, oh, wow. And, uh, uh, in fact, uh, uh, he and I, right there first, we're the only two Americans, along with Sergeant Doney, you know. And uh, um, and I, I was the new guy, and uh, but a couple of our team members, uh, had the uh, like uh, one of them was a uh, uh, Chung, I think his name was Chung, and uh, uh, he was a Chinese nun, uh, and he had been wounded, so he, he came back to the team. And I said, Oh, here's the new guy. And he said, No, I'm, I'm not the new guy, you're the new guy. <laughs> <laughs> of course, he's correct. You gotta pick but, uh, um, yeah, um. Uh, what a what a great man! I've heard that. from nu- numerous uh, Sog men that he was just a not only a good guy, great friend, but just uh, outstanding in the woods, as y'all say. Yeah, um, my only mission with him was actually a local patrol, because. Uh, uh, um, maybe that's not the case. Um, well, right after I joined, he went home on the 30 day leave because he extended six months. Oh, that's right. Okay. And, and, uh, and so maybe it was after I, uh, uh, cause I ran a couple missions with Sergeant Donnie, just him and me. We didn't have, uh, Dale oh. at that point. Oh, okay. I, I and Kim forgot. Was in the state. And Kim was in the state. Yeah, I took that picture. Yeah, that's yours. Yeah, that's you, our translator. And boy, <laughs> bless his heart, man. But as soon as we got in a firefight, he, you know, he ran. He got the hell away. <laughs> we had a, we ended up having a three-way split team. Gosh, that that that's I'd forgotten that it was you and uh, only you and Mister Norm for quite a while, and I mean. Yeah. Can can uh I've got a photo of Dale too, but he uh we'll we'll get to Mr. Dale coming in uh in just a minute. But uh can you speak a little bit about uh Mr. Mr. Norm, uh what he was not only like in the field, of course, but first impressions, what what he was like because we've heard so much about him. Well, he was really bigger than life. Um, he uh he 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 was proud of what he, his exploits. He always had these men's magazine called Stag or something like that that ran articles about his exploits, like in the you know his early Vietnam days and stuff. And the, uh, but the, uh, he loved what he was doing, and uh, like Howard, you know, just loved what he was doing. Um, thought the most of his men, and I was a wise ass. He was forty years old, and I was twenty. And, you know, I came up on the Beatles, you know, and he was like, you know, Frank Sinatra, you know what I'm saying? And uh, 
So I was always being a wise ass. And he should have, he probably should have knocked me down, you know, but uh, I was always being a wise ass. And, uh, uh, but that one mission where uh, I was, they kind of formed a perimeter around me because I had the radio and uh, they were setting up for like an ambush basically. And, uh, um, and here comes this uh, um, NVA guy uh, walking down the trail. And uh, uh, of course, like all ambushes, uh, uh, it was tripped early, you know, not by Sergeant Doney, but by uh, uh, one of the uh, uh, in, in one of our Vietnamese kids, and uh, uh, shot this guy, and and then the ensuing firefight, uh, Sergeant Doney got a piece of shrapnel right under his eye, and uh, uh, and I lost my hat. I had one of them fuck you hats, but I I had one of them hats that said. And I had them stitch into the mama sign that said, happiness is a warm gun. I don't know if you ever remember that song by the Beatles. But I, have, I have. Happiness is a warm gun. So, uh, and I lost it. And, you know, got knocked in, in, in our D mile, you know, uh, it got knocked on my head. And Sergeant Doney is sitting there bleeding out of his eye, you know, he says, you want to go back and get it? <laughs> No, I, I, I think the is the better part of Valor there. I, I don't need to go find it. <laughs> wow. And, but that's and I mean, the kind of guy he was. I mean, in the other that kind of intense thing, he said, do you want to go back and get it? <laughs> he, uh, but he, carried, he carried that poor, <clears throat> you know, POW basically, for lack of a better term, you know, all the way to the landing zone, you know, where, where extraction that and stuff and and uh, um, when we land that chopper, Sergeant Howard comes out and grabs that little guy and carries him to the dispensary. This dispensary, and uh, uh, and Ken Worthley always said to me, said, "Can you imagine that kid feeling when you know he's surrounded by these big Americans, and here it is, Sergeant Howard comes up and swoops him up and runs him to the dispensary." <laughs> And I never thought about that, but that's what Ken said. <laughs> the, the, now this is uh, this will come up later because you are actually friends with the guys who who got this particular prisoner. But y'all y'all can just imagine, like he's saying, Bob Howard having you wrapped up in his big six foot two, two hundred and ten pound arms after you've just been snatched off the trail. Uh, there's uh, I mean, and and whisking you away. I mean, I I can't imagine. I'm surprised he's not peeing his pants. Although he, yeah. he might have and already. I'm not have. sure. I'll, I'll be honest with you. I'm not sure if that's our guy that we got or not. The, this is that, actually RT Texas's uh, okay, Dave Gilmer. I didn't think that was our guy. Mm -hmm. There's a uh, Glenn, as a matter of Glenn. fact, right there. Um, and that is uh, Kirsch right there, Kirsch bomb. Mm -hmm. yeah. With a claymore on his chest, he was actually getting ready to take Kentucky out. Him and grab uh, Ron. Great photo. Uh, that'll come up later because uh, you actually, like we just said, you you're pretty. You knew uh, Mr. Nowak and Mr. Gilmer. Uh, Dave's a wonderful man. We're hoping to uh, get him on and uh, get oh, Richard uh, Nowak. Uh, Richard uh, trying to get uh, yeah. Mr. Gilmer on also. Um, yeah, those guys, they were the best of friends. Uh, Jason Gilbert was wanting, wanting to know about Glenn's nickname. Was it Johnny something? I always heard he was called the Duke or Duke. and I I just always called him Glenn. Yeah, that's a, I, it, maybe the nickname came later or something, but I just always called him Glenn. One thing I would tell you about Glenn, though, is that the, his favorite band was the Rascals, the Young Rascals, and he loved the drums. You know, yeah. he, he he loved uh, Dino Donnelly, the drummer for the grass movement. And I know that's a mundane thing, but... Uh, um, that I, This is why we love having people on to hear stuff like that. And I know his family uh, watches sometimes just to hope uh, we mention him. So uh, this is what we're here for. Nothing you say is mundane at all. I've uh, got a great picture of Glenn. i got a great picture of him. And maybe you've seen it before, but he's... Holding the puppy dog, he's eating the cupcake and eat, and holding a puppy dog. <laughs> oh yes, that is a great photo, and that one's in one of these books. And I wish I would, 
I, I'm, I'll see if I can find I it. I took and that show. picture too. So you took a lot of good photos. Uh, what was? Oh, I was looking for a Glenn Umera while you're talking. Um, because I've got a photo as well that has just come out. It's supposed to be in a another SOG book, but I'll keep looking at that while we're. I just remember the guy who introduced me to Glenn was a guy named James F. Martin. And uh, uh, he was a good guy. He was from Ohio. Uh, his sister was married to a guy that uh, managed a hotel in Raleigh. And we would always all go up to, uh, to Raleigh and, uh, uh, you know, party on the weekend and stuff like that. But, you know, we were like, you know, you could tell we were in the military because there were our haircuts and we were around all these long hair people and they're, we're kind of like the plague to them, you know. <laughs> but uh, um, yeah, and James, James ended up going AWOL. You know, that was the summer of love and all that stuff, you know. So he got the, uh, he got all peace nicked out and and I never knew what happened to him. I was, he was a good guy. Uh, he, we, uh, uh, we jumped together and stuff. And like I say, he's the one who introduced me to Glenn. And the, uh, just always valued that. I've got there. See, this was actually, and I for the of course now that I'm looking for the photo of Glenn sitting at Docto, I can't find it. But there, here is a photo of uh, Glenn and training group, and I'd like to see if you recognize any of these guys because I believe this could be your class. We got Bob uh, Bechtold. Right here, I believe that Skip Minix, and there's Glenn and Terry Cadden back right there. You know, those those are familiar faces, but I didn't know those guys that well. Okay, but that uh, must have be after uh, uh, that was after Phase One when we got our braids and before we got the Flash. You know, yeah, because that's what happened. You know, you got your braids after I think after Phase One. And then, and then uh, uh, you didn't get the flash until you graduated. I could have sworn. Uh, guys, I will post it later. And, of course, the moment we get off here, it'll be the first photo I see. I'm even looking on <laughs> Facebook for it, but I, I hate it. Um, it was a good photo of Glenn. He's sitting there with his uh, Catch Me, F Me hat on uh, as well, sitting there talking to some guys. Great photo. Um so it, we, I forgot where we were even at. Uh, oh, uh, Mr. Norm Doney. We so we've uh, you've run a few missions with with Mr. Norm, uh, and Dale's about to come in. Before that, what, what was the ethnic makeup you said of Florida? Were they all Viet or were they Nungs? Or? Uh, no, there was uh, well, what they were. They were all Viet, but the uh, Chang was a Chinese Nung, and. Uh, and uh, we had one kid, we have two actually, one real old guy and one real young guy. They had both been captured in Chu Hoy. Are you familiar with that term, Chu Hoy? Uh, Taking where uh, he gives up and... Well, they get captured and then they get indoctrinated, you know, and they said, hey, you stay with us, fight for us, we'll give you a lot of money, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, one was real, real old and and uh, uh, one was a, a real young, and poor guy, the real young one, you know, he probably walked down the Ho Chi Minh Trail and got captured right away because he couldn't have been more than 19, you know, 18, 19. And, uh, um, but the, uh, it, and we had, uh, our Arvin was Chen. And, uh, and he, as Arvin's go, he seemed like a pretty good guy to me. I can't remember him really running uh because me and donnie were with one other vietnamese and i think it was chen uh and of course you know we all got picked up separately you know um you know we didn't meet somewhere and then make it to an extraction place um uh, i um i did and i took that picture too Mm -hmm. and that, I've got it. I got it in an album somewhere, but that's actually a Christmas card. Uh, I made that into a Christmas card, and it said "Peace on Earth, Goodwill Toward Men." 
Let's see here. I think. Yep. I, oh, yeah. That's wor that's Worsley, though. I'm I'm right behind Ken. That's what I thought because. Oh, yep. Here it is. You sent me the whole thing. Oh, there it is. Yep. Yeah. Yep. I had that full picture that you. I think you sent of the original too that I had. That was a great photo. I love that y'all made y'all's own Christmas cards too. <laughs> that's great. Um, and was that in Vietnam? Uh, a, a local that y'all were doing? That was a local said? patrol, yeah, yeah, that's okay. in country. Just outside what would, the camp. What were uh, how far and what would y'all be up to on a local? Uh, not really that far, but uh, it was the strangest thing, man, because as we're walking down paths like that, out of nowhere, we'd see Mama San and Papa San, you know, come walking by with a basket of. of sticks and wood you know on their backs and stuff like that and we're just standing there like i almost want to say idiot because they were sitting there with a gun you know and they're just walking by doing their daily routine and stuff you know but all, all in all you know they were enjoying some kind of uh stableness because we were there you know we were there. that had to be so weird uh I just or strange you know that was my first patrol, you know. <laughs> like, you know, that's before I went across the tent, you know. Wow. Well, at least you uh, were getting kind of cohesive uh, and and getting to go out a little bit. Uh, yeah. Yeah. With uh, we've got some questions coming in. Um, and actually, somebody while we're talking about Mr. Norm uh and the team uh. He was asking uh, about Norm and Project Delta, and I was letting him know, yes, Norm had two uh, prior tours with Project yeah, Delta. I was, was going to say it was prior, yeah. Yeah. Uh, could you tell immediately when you got there that he uh, was he, he, he knew exactly what he was doing and what was going on? You know, um, I would like to say yes, but I wasn't that uh, – uh, he didn't anything, you know. I wasn't. I didn't even know. Uh, in my life, just like the way I went into things, I didn't really pay attention to my surroundings that much. I was that. Um, uh, I was just not that um, cognitive of of the world at the time. You know, I was just just tooling along like an idiot, and uh, um, I mean. Uh, the luckiest thing that ever happened to me was probably going into CCC, you know, as opposed to going to an A team or, or not going into special forces at all. The best thing that happened to me was my own obliviousness of actually I ended up in the Green Berets. You know, that, that that's probably the best thing that ever happened to me in the sense that uh, maybe it's it's a, a afterthought from the surviving it all, but I don't think I had done as well. In any other situation, you know, I, I'd have probably been busted. I'd probably been, you know, I mean, I wasn't smoking pot or anything like that, but I just had an attitude, you know. And with that attitude, it was a good thing that I was in SF because they accepted it, you know. Perfectly cut out for SOG, it sounds like, uh, at least uh, attitude wise yeah. already. <laughs> uh, see, um, Jason was wondering, um, uh, I guess the whole time while you were with Florida, or I guess uh, maybe your whole tour were, uh, oh, did the point man on all your teams carry an AK or was this, uh, did he carry one at all? I think the one, that, uh, I think the one of Florida, uh, the ball is our tail gunner. Um, I think, uh, the ball carried an M79. But, uh, I think our point man carried a car uh, fifteen, M actually an M sixteen. I don't think the, uh, uh, the you know the Vietnamese had cars. You know they just had M sixteens, I believe. Okay. Wow. And did you uh, did you have your did you have a car fifteen right from the get go or? Uh, I think I had an M sixteen, but it didn't last very long. I had a, I got a car pretty quickly. And I love that gun. I was just that fixing to say, I, I bet you uh, were were proud as heck to get that thing, especially after the M16. Yeah, uh, it was it was 
to me, without even realizing, I just thought it was cool. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's, it I looks it good. Cool. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Wow. And, and, uh, and when I left uh, and went to Camo, Ken, Ken said to me, man, did you turn in your car 15? And I said, yeah, I did. And he said, man, I don't think I could ever do that. Wow. I, I, I mean, I, heck, you, you get so close to that thing and I, I, I can imagine. So I, I bet all of y'all would have loved to have been able to sneak that bad boy home, broken it down or done what y'all had needed to do and, and get those things back home. Gosh. Yeah. Um, I never even thought about that, to be honest, but uh, uh, it was a good weapon. I liked it. I like the M16. I never had any problem. People tell me about the about them jamming and stuff like that. I never had any problem with it. I kept it clean, you know. And people said they never clean theirs. You know, said there were two schools of thoughts: clean it and don't clean it. You know, but I always kept mine clean and uh, uh, never had a problem with it ever. Kirschbaum, he he never got a car 15 he he kept his uh david kirschbaum guys rt kentucky and rt main uh he he kept his 16 as a matter of fact that bob howard photo he still got his 16 with him yeah i noticed that, noticed that. he loved that thing he as was well. a good man uh, he is he's he's, he's 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 great we finally gotten him on facebook uh in the group uh the the saw group i run and he's uh gosh he's got some stories man i mean he has got some history uh throughout his years in the army uh just amazing stuff he shares with did us. he stay in he uh did for a little while not too long but he did for a little while yes sir hell he he, he had done uh you know quite some time before that he he was in i think since the 50s uh at least the late 50s early 60s because yeah. I, I think he had a combat deployment to gosh i can't where not combat i guess it was a deployment to uh was it venezuela no it was one of the south american countries i'm mixing it up panama maybe one one, one of the others I, I forgot where but um people are asking about tact uh let's see um jason when something like that with the woodcutters walking up on y'all did y'all assume they went straight back to the nva or the vc and and immediately gave y'all's position up or told that y'all were on the ground i imagine he's referring to trackers Tra yes sir and uh i remember um being uh you know tailed by trackers for a long time throughout the day sometimes you know and uh, you know, it was if you were getting somewhere they didn't want you to go, they'd make, you know, they'd be banging on the trees or something like that, you know. And, and then when you got away, got away from it, you didn't hear it so much. But when you got closer again, you heard it. Uh, and uh, one of the big firefights, uh, we we had uh, trackers, and then you know, we eventually got into a firefight. Uh, the one with Bingham, actually, um, and uh, that was a result of it probably trackers letting them know that we were there you know and that uh gosh did you ever i mean did y'all uh we're, we're, i'm reading a book now uh and he's talking about hearing bugles and whistles uh what did you were they doing that or was it just the the beating of the bamboo to uh yeah the beating of the bamboo i never heard whistles or anything still scary enough hearing them trying to cattle yeah, move y'all yeah, in yeah. like cattle that's Basically, I think if I remember correctly, usually they said it was women and children. That is terrifying. Um, BF would like to know: uh, Did you eventually get the a uh, thirty round mag uh, with your car fifteen, or were you always using the? 20 I just rounds? had the twenty round mags, and I always put eighteen in them, mm -hmm. and I carried them in canteen covers. You know, I have four canteen covers right here, you know, right, you know, right here, you know, on my web belt. And uh, so you lean your, your rifle, well, you know, your arms on it and stuff. But uh, I carried, I had four, uh, four canteen covers with, uh, uh, These yeah, right here. Yeah, uh, with 18, eight, uh, 
with, I forget, maybe eight or nine to fit into a canteen cover and 18 rounds in the, in the clip. I wasn't a fan of the banana clip or, or anything like that. And I don't know for any particular reason, you know. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. No. Um, did, uh, w- w- when you first got there, uh, was uh, Bob Howard, was he uh, in the supply or was he in the field? Or... Yeah, when I got there, they had, he'd already been put in for the Congressional Medal of Honor. And uh, uh, so they uh, uh, they frowned on him running any missions. They didn't want anything to happen to him. But I do know for a fact that he did run a couple of missions, you know, just just because, you know, he had to get, he had to. That's, what, that's who he was, you know. And uh, um, what a, what a, uh, an interesting guy. I mean, I I had more than a few beers with him. You know, what I mean, sat around the table in the club drinking beer. You know, and uh, and just shooting the shit. You know, about anything. You know, and, uh, he would tell an occasional story. And uh, uh, but yeah, uh, never ran a mission with him. But he was, but he was in. He was, I, I didn't even know if what he was in. I didn't know if it was supply or if it was like core. I mean, if it was like uh, there he is. Um, if it was like the, the admin, you know what I'm saying? I didn't know what his function was there. But I did get to see him years later, around uh, the year 2000, 2001. Um, I got to go to Korea with, the, uh, I was road managing this uh, country singer and we were playing Korea and there's a restaurant on base in Korea. Uh, and it's a, you know, the Medal of Honor restaurant. And I was telling our liaison, this captain, I was telling him the story about Howard. And he said, you know what? I think he's here. And, uh, and so the next day, he got me hooked up to go meet. You know, I called him Sergeant Howard, but by this time he's retired, he was a colonel, you know. Mm-hmm. He got that battlefield commission, basically. And uh, so I'm meeting him, and, I, um, and he says, I'm, I was vaguely familiar to him. You know, and uh, and of course, here's what I do, like an idiot. Uh, yeah, I, I was on RT Florida, and you know, I was with uh, Bob Norman. And he said, no, I, mean, I was with Bob Doney. I was with Robert Doney. And he said his name was Norm. And I thought, oh my God, that's right, it was Norm. But, you know, I was just... <laughs> wow. Uh, there's, uh, there's some great speeches of him uh, around that time, and... Uh, of course, sadly, he got sick and, and passed away from, from cancer. But there are some amazing speeches uh, on, on YouTube, him addressing some crowds uh, at some veterans events around around I'll that time. I'll have to look that up because I didn't realize that. I do have a thing I got from the Pritzker. Uh, you know, you're familiar with the Pritzker group. It's a, uh, they honor a lot of the military stuff, and they, they do like a, it's an hour and a half interview with uh, uh, Sergeant Don, uh, Sergeant Howard, and uh, uh, it's a great interview. And, and of course, I have a friend I work with, and I showed him a picture of Howard. He said that smile looks more like a snarl. <laughs> there, there, there's some good ones on uh, YouTube. There's uh, some. Uh, to where he's given speeches that are really just absolutely inspiring. And then someone sat him down. Uh, you can see he's getting very, he's quite sick at, at the time, but he right. got just the strength of a bull. And he's uh, telling, uh, recounting the event that he earned the Medal of Honor for. And uh, it, it is just moving. I mean, I, I get goosebumps thinking about it right now. Is that when he uh, went in and rescued Joe uh, Walker? Mm-hmm. And Mr. Yeah, and uh, right. and Mr. Sheridan ended up getting KIA, and he had to get his body and all of that. It was quite a quite an ordeal on that slam operation out there. Um, um, are you familiar with Buddy Gilbert? No, Buddy sir. Was, uh, uh, at CCC, in fact, he came up. He got separated from his team one time, and uh, uh, but he uh, was out in the woods, and jungle by himself for a couple of weeks until he got rescued. But uh, uh, Howard stayed with Buddy the, probably the last couple of weeks of his life. He he visited Buddy, and uh, um, 
but he had this jacket that had a lot of stuff on it, Vietnam stuff on it, and Howard liked it so much that but he gave it to him. Wow, I, uh, he uh, uh, that that is. Uh, did you say where where did he end up? How did he end up getting out of the woods if he was gone for a week? Who they 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 found him. They found him. My God. Um, wow. I don't know if you ever talked to Alan Farrell, but Alan probably knows that story better than I do. Okay. Um, I will make a note of that to ask Alan that. Yes, I speak to Mr. Gre another great man. Oh, uh, he's an amazing man. An amazing man. Probably brilliant. Probably, oh, yeah. <laughs> Certainly that. Certainly brilliant. Yeah. You were with a quite quite a few uh, uh, uh smart guys. As, as a matter of fact, your uh, first uh, I think I guess you could say first uh, teammate on Florida, uh, Mister uh, Dale Dale Hanson. I, I believe he's a, a Mensa member, well, isn't he? Oh, I think so. Yeah, yeah, he's, yeah. He's brilliant too. Uh, yeah, he, I always you know a lot of these guys uh, because they came to in country after I got there. I always thought I was older than it, but as it turns out, you know, I was the young one actually. Uh, yeah, you, uh, Mike Bucklin, uh, are definitely the young. I believe the youngest two that I know. Uh, how old were you when you got there? Twenty. I was uh, twenty. I was twenty, okay. but I think I was older than Mike. Okay, I was about to say you two by far. Uh, I know Howard was like. Howard Sugar, I believe, was 22, maybe, or something like that. Y'all are the youngest of, of that group, and I <laughs> I cannot imagine 20-year-olds doing anything of the like today. That That is just unbelievable. <laughs> um, while we're talking about Bob, I don't know if you, since you might not have seen him go on missions, I've seen him, uh, heard people talk about him and, and carrying stuff, but do you know – uh, what what he carried as a weapon, his, his rifle and sidearm? I do not know. I do not know. I just assumed it was car 15. Now, are you familiar with the guy named DeLima, Sergeant DeLima? Bill, he yes, was, sir. Yeah. Uh, when uh, he was uh, observing me and Glenn and Bingham, you know, because Glenn was a, uh, was a, uh, was the first time as a team leader. And but the when I saw Sergeant Delima out there with this a forty five, I couldn't believe it. He went out there with a forty five. That was it. <laughs> Good <laughs> Lord, that you is know, you know. I just thought there was something that was had automatic, you know, something that would lay down a field of fire. But he just because he was the observer, he just went out there with a forty five. He that what a uh, brave. I mean, all y'all are brave, but that's a uh, whole nother level of brave right there. Uh, I've uh, I've actually heard Jerry Shriver, uh, when he excuse me, was moved over to the hatchet forces, he actually carried a uh, uh, only carried a pistol out with him. And someone Dave Meyer told me this or told us this, uh, because there's all these rumors about him and. He let them build up, and you know, he, he told Dave a few of them that were the that were true and weren't true. And he said uh, he didn't carry you know twenty guns into battle. He's like, heck, sometimes I only carry a pistol and a knife with me when I'm with my mountain yards and the hatchet force. And Dave was like, what? He's like, yeah, if but I got to see what is going on, and if I you know if they get to me by that time, we're already in trouble if they're you know if I'm having to fight. So wow. <laughs> crazy. Crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, oh, Jason's got one about uh, how tall and uh, what was your weight uh, when you got in country? In I think I was 5'6", five, 5'7", five, and I was 123 pounds. Good <laughs> Lord. The, the, the pack was almost as big as you can. Yeah, a 28-inch waist, you know. <laughs> Good Lord. I, I was the smallest kid in my high school as a senior. I was still the smallest kid in high school as a senior. I graduated high school four foot eleven. That is, and in there, you know, there's there's guys that were uh, a little bit uh, smaller than you and your, uh, you know, your size. Uh, being that small, a wasn't uncommon well, because one of them right there, is Twiggy. 
Yeah. That, that, yeah, that's Bill Long right there. Tony DeQuino, I believe. Yeah, Tony DeQuino. Uh, I got to see him again with Dale at the uh, at the special operations uh, uh, reunion. Oh, wow. But that's wow. Twiggy on the blue shirt. Mm-hmm. And, and, but I, I think I was just as skinny as he was. <laughs> oh, he he was. He is he is tiny. I, I I can't believe how skinny some of these guys were. But then I think, look at what y'all are carrying. How long y'all are out in the field for? Uh, I believe that's Tim Lynch from RT Ohio. Yeah, yeah. What a good kid! What a amazing, good guy. amazing recon man. I've heard that he was just outstanding. Uh, are y'all in the club right here? Or yeah, that's the club. New Year's Eve, 19, you know, December 31st, 1969. Oh, boy. I bet y'all were, uh, I bet fun fun was had that night. Some girlfriend, some ex-girlfriend has that shirt that I have on. <laughs> oh, man. And she, she has no idea what she has either. <laughs> wow. Um, Probably some, into the, some rags. Ah. God, I don't don't even say that. That makes me so that makes me hurt inside thinking of that. Uh, Same here. I didn't realize what I had either. Man, <laughs> Jason, approximately how many drinks <laughs> have you taken in at that point, Tom? <laughs> it, it, from the looks that of it, quite a, well, <laughs> yeah, that was a great that was a great photo though. That was it a great was photo. absolutely. Uh, did y'all have teams out on New Year's, or did y'all get to stand down? I couldn't even tell you, to be honest. Uh, I imagine there probably were, but I, I really couldn't tell you honestly. God, talk about a bad gig being out on New Year's uh, in in the field. That would that would stink. <laughs> but job's a job. You got to do what you got to do. Yeah, I um, spent the, uh, I spent a, a a New Year's Eve on the. Uh, on Leghorn. Now, uh, we're jumping ahead a bit, but I, I figured we could go ahead and talk about it since we're mentioning Leghorn here. Was this the unfortunate incident of when you were hit by lightning? Yeah, um, three of us. And it was, for me, it was probably an indirect hit. Um, I was there with the, I don't know if you ever heard of Sergeant Alvin McDonald. But he was a great, great dude, man. A great uh, person, a smart guy, uh, the good old Kentucky boy, you know. And him, me, and I want to think it was uh, the guy's last name was either No or Ro, or Noe is what I think it was. Bob, no, uh, maybe. Could be. Uh, but uh, I was just just got done talking to Greg up in the uh, uh, he, he was doing the cubby thing. And uh, I just got done talking to him, and we—I guess we'd help extract the team. And uh, all of a sudden, man, I just start going like this, you're going crazy, and the guys will look at me like, "What the hell's going on?" Like I'm having a conniption fit. And all of a sudden, I'm just propelled into them across the bunker, and uh, you know, we just kind of shake ourselves off and go step outside to see what the heck happened. And it happened again. And and uh, it flipped me up and threw me down, and uh, put, kind of paralyzed me into a semi-fetal position. But uh, no, was blown up against a frying pan that we had hanging there, and that caught him on fire. His his clothes were in tatters, and he was on fire. And uh, Sergeant uh, McDonald put out put out the uh, flames and stuff, and. Uh, um, Actually, we we lost all radio at that time. The antennas were gone. That's what happened. The lightning came down through the antennas. We initially thought we were being hit, and uh, uh, but uh, uh, Sergeant McDonald grabbed a prick twenty five and was able to get contact with the um, with Covey, and uh, um, you know we got uh, no extracted, and then uh, then it, Sergeant McDonald and I got out the next day. There's uh, Sergeant McDonald in Illinois right there. Uh, okay, that's him. That's him. By golly, blurry those. That's him. He was a, he was a uh, just a stalwart of a person. 
I, 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 and I believe uh, Mr. Greg uh, was uh, flying Covey or something at that point. Was yeah, he in the air? Yeah, yeah. He, my, my, uh, my call sign was headmaster, but he always called me Broadway. <laughs> After Joe and Amy, you know, Broadway Joe. He's just like, uh, but, uh, and you know, uh, I'm sure I told you this story, but the, um, Ohio State University, I, I lived right around there, and um, I'm riding a shotgun, and my buddy's driving, and we put the stop sign, and I look to my right, and by golly, there's Greg Glasshouse, and standing there with a tennis racket, tennis outfit, white shorts, talking to some girl. And of course, I immediately just get out of the car and walk up to him and kiss him in his ear. <laughs> <laughs> big old, big old wet kiss in the ear, you know. The girl was appalled. <laughs> oh, I, I can only imagine what she was thinking at that point in time. <laughs> oh, and Greg man. and I have been able to get together over the years here and there and stuff. And the, uh, uh, just what a what a great guy. He is. I was so glad he uh, he's he's so quiet and and doesn't. He's very humble and uh, I, I was just so glad he uh, uh, came on here and spoke and and shared with the crowd and and was uh, answered some questions for us. He's he's quite the man. That's that's for sure. Yeah. Um. He uh he definitely spoke highly of you and of course uh Glenn he uh he he spoke about uh getting to enjoy uh some of the some of the uh packages that uh Mama Yamora sent uh sent y'all that Glenn would share quite heavily with the crowd right. y'all to eat right. eat like kings for a while. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um. Can you talk a little bit about what uh we're flipping back in time and all that? I apologize, guys. Um, but can you speak a little bit about what uh I don't know how long it was, but what it was like getting uh Mr. Dale on the team with you and uh Norm and and uh how he was uh on the team, what it was like working with Dale? Well, he blew my mind at first because, like you said, he's you know uh. And I thought, see, I thought he had the upbringing of a Christian family, but it was actually, uh, as I learned in reading his book, that uh, uh, it was neighbors of his that he got interested in in Christianity and stuff. But to uh, to get the uh, um, the true sense of the Bible, he uh, learned, you know, to read Greek, you know, learned to read Hebrew and Greek. I think it was, and I thought, my God. You know, what an undertaking. So I felt like he had to be, and he was, he was very, very dedicated in the sense of like, he was there to fight communism. Mm -hmm. There was no doubt about that. He was definitely there to fight communism. And, uh, um, and so, but uh, we had, we had some good times. There was never a drinker or anything like that, you know, but the, uh, uh, we enjoyed each other's company for, for the bit that I was, and I think uh, um, I ran that mission with Hawaii uh, before Dale ever went out on a mission to Florida, I believe. I believe. Because I, I think wow. a couple of missions were like in August, and the one with Ken, when Ken got killed, was in, in, in August. Maybe now August 22nd or something like that. Now, were uh, you had already moved on to uh, Hawaii when he uh, ended up having his and, terrible? And yeah, and it was no more than uh, one day. I, I, Glenn and I are talking, and he says, "I got a mission coming up. I'm going to be the team leader. Delima's getting ready to leave, and he's just going to come out and watch us. Would you want to come out with me on, on this mission as my one one?" And I, and I said, sure, yeah, I said, sure. And that's when Bingham joined our group. And uh, of course, he was the radio operator at the time, carried the radio. And, uh, um, but yeah, so I, it wasn't like I joined Hawaii. It's just that he asked me to go on on the, on the run with them. And since well, I wouldn't do anything, I said, sure. Yeah. And uh, he, was a, uh, he was a good team leader, I thought. You know, yeah, that 
that that was just a a, a heck of a, a a mission that Dale and them went through. And so w w with Glenn, w I, I I was under the assumption in um and while I'm speaking of it, before I get into it, guys, um, two great books. One uh, is Uncommon Valor by Stephen Moore. Um, I'm in talks right now to actually have him come speak to us about researching for this book and speaking to a lot of the CCC vets. Um, and uh, the book that Joe, uh, Joe was just speaking about, Dale's book, Born Twice, uh, his memoir uh, of a SOG warrior. Wonderful, wonderful book. Um, but I was under the assumption from reading that this was also the first time that Glenn led his own team. It was. It was. Okay. That's why Delima was out there as an observer, you know, to, to see how okay. he did. You know. Wow. So it was um, it was Delima as an observer. It was Glenn first time as a one zero. And was uh, this um, Dennis Bingham's uh, first, first, mission. first mission as well? Yep. Oh, gosh. In uh, in Juliet nine, I believe. I believe so, yeah. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Um can you uh I I know uh, you don't have to get into much if you don't want to, but could you speak a little bit about what what, what that mission was like? Yeah, um and then, you know what uh years ago I wrote a story about it. And uh I know I've got a copy of it in the hard print somewhere, but I I wrote a couple fleshed out a story about it, that experience. Um, but, uh, you know, as things happen with with me and computers, I lost everything on my computer, you know, so but I still feel like I'm somewhere in the garage, I've got a hard copy of it. But uh, um, yeah, uh, I mean, I shouldn't say this, but the first time I met uh, Dennis, I'm in the club. And I hear this guy talking, and of course, I'm kind of, my head's on the table because I've had a few drinks and I look up and here's this big goofy looking guy, you know, talking about, you know, real excited about, you know, doing, doing the thing and talking about how, like when he gets done with the uh, Vietnam, he wants to join a border patrol somewhere. So I thought, boy, that's pretty, pretty wild. But anyway, uh, uh, so I met Dennis again, basically when we were doing the, uh, um, Oh, you know, the, going to the uh, artillery range, the field, you know, rifle range, and uh, you know, practicing, uh, you know, making contact and breaking contact and that kind of thing. The steps you go through, and uh, um, so we go, we go out, and uh, um, the very first night, they know we're there. We got inserted, and it was, you know, late late afternoon, so we couldn't go too far before it got dark. And uh, I mean, they uh, they start sending artillery our way. And I'll be honest, it sounded like big artillery to me. It wasn't just like a, a, a mortars, you know. I mean, but it's, and it's walking. You can hear it hit far away and walk closer and closer, and like to your west. And then you hear, coming from the, from the north and the east and the south, but it never got on us, you know? So the next day we, we, uh, um, we uh, you know, start walking again and, and uh, going for a little bit. And um, this is when we hear the trackers and stuff. And I'm giving the abridged version here. You know? uh, um, we hear trackers and so we kind of like, uh, stop and uh, um, and I I don't even know where Delima is at this point. You know, I just know Glenn Glenn's right here, uh, uh, Bingham's right there, um, and we decide to get up and start walking somewhere. And of course, as soon as we walk, uh, all hell breaks loose. It's like they had set up an ambush for us, and, uh, and like any ambush, they. Had they waited till we got more out there, they could have got us all probably. But they got, you know, they got the uh, the first report man basically, and uh, um, 
and I should say this, before that happened, we were in a situation where Glenn asked us, do you guys want to keep going or do you want to just call in and get, and get the heck out of here? And of course I said, well, let's get out. And of course Bingham said, no, no, let's keep going, let's keep going. And that, that's when, when we walk, got up and tried to walk, that's when all hell broke loose. And, uh, and of course we were in extended fire fight right there in position and they're sending RPGs and, and that's what got Dennis was a, a, an RPG from above and uh, and I was setting him as close as I am to my drink over here, basically. And, uh, um, um, you know, I, I pulled the, I pulled the radio. Glenn tells me to get the radio off of Dennis, and and, and I give him the mic. And uh, so we uh, um, we worked to getting to finding a, a, an L, you know, an LZ or some place where they can come pick us up. And we get we get Dennis out of there, and we get the uh, uh, the point man out of there, which was you know uh, no easy task because Dennis was a big boy. And uh, um, and uh, but we got everybody back in. The, uh, that was the same day. I'll never forget this. But that was the same day that they they launched the guys up to the July seventeenth. I think it was the day that they sent the guys to the moon. Yeah, it 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 says when when you got the radio and the book. Uh, but uh, when when you got Glenn the the radio that. He, he he called as much as he possibly could in uh, and and whatever w was available to, to 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 rock the area and and like you said uh y'all finally got the two bodies and thank god no one was left behind uh and y'all got home uh safe uh the, the rest of you I should say uh that that is just Terrible, terrible, and I mean, but that's uh, that's SOG. I mean, that that's uh, y'all were doing dangerous stuff. I mean, did, did you did you know? Did you feel like uh, no matter what, uh, they were gonna spring the attack? Were they? Did they think maybe y'all were gonna call and they were gonna try and get some some helicopters? W what do you think was was going on? Oh, well, I think. Um, uh, well, what I think is that the, um, while we were in that firefight, I uh, uh, I just remember, you know, them firing, us firing. I was trying to fire for effect, you know, <laughs> more than anything. But I, but I remember seeing an RPG hit a tree and come down not too far from me, and it never went off. And I did. I told myself, well, you know, I, I realized that I was no hero because I wasn't going to go jump on it, you know. <laughs> but it never went off. And uh, uh, but uh, you know, with, with them F4s and everything, and, and that's what happened. They bring in those F4s that, that took care of the, of the enemy right there. You know what I mean? And they, they if they didn't all get killed, they got the hell out of there. And we were able to make it to the to the extraction point. And when the choppers uh, for extraction, were they actually able to 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 land, or did y'all have to uh, hook up? Yeah, they, they 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 landed pretty close. They were hovering, you know, but they were like uh, it wasn't no mean feet to get up there. I mean, it was mean feet to throw bodies up there, so to speak, you know. But the, uh, yeah, it was they were down there, and it was Americans. It wasn't the uh, the king bees. It was it was the Americans and. Uh, I can't remember if there was just one chopper or if there were two, to be honest with you. Show my. Wow. There's uh Yeah. There's and see, uh, it's funny. That picture, I'd seen it for years, but it was always from the Midwest. Uh, you know, and I'll put my hand out here. But it was always from, from here up, I saw it. And I thought, man, what a goofy expression he has. But then when I seen it about a year or so ago, when I saw that picture like that with now the, that would make sense, you know. It's like the da, you know, and, and it's a great picture. And uh, 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 and you know, I've actually got to meet his uh, his niece, oh. and his, and I met his sister, and I met his sister for the first time four or five years ago, maybe ten years ago, 
and I got to see her again this past summer. Oh my gosh! Wow, what was that like? Uh, well, the first time I was really hesitant, uh, but I knew that she needed to. Mm-hmm. Wow, God, that is that that is so strange. That I mean, they're. Uh, matter five you know five ten years ago and then uh, here again you bumped into her not too not too long ago well, it wasn't uh, bumping into them uh, uh, uh you know i've been on the road with bands you know uh country singer and uh they followed him so when they found out that i i was working for him you know that's what i did for a living that they came to a couple shows you know wow so neat wow We'll we'll uh, have to talk about that when you uh, here in just a bit when we get towards the end because that uh very interesting uh job you've got after after Sog um we've gotten to uh m- most of your 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 career here uh, uh although you 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 did a lot more than what we've spoken about but um I do have some pictures uh that I would like to show that. Um, showing you in the field and some other ones that we've got of some guys. Uh, speaking of Twiggy and um, Dan Sturr, here is one. Uh, was, uh, they're actually standing in front of the board uh, with uh, some of Mr. Norm Doney's think sheets up on the board. Yeah. Dan Sturr always said he should have been a movie star. <laughs> he, gosh, he uh, he cuts a, cuts a figure, doesn't he? Yeah, he does, and he was an extremely intelligent guy. Extremely intelligent guy. I I don't think he'd remember me at all, but uh, oh but, no, he uh, remembers I, you. I, I was I've, impressed I've, by him. I've posted pictures in the group and uh, mentioned you, and he asked how you were doing, and he he definitely remembers you. Yeah. I'll have to tell him uh, hello and share this with him. I wish he uh he's on the road a lot now. He's uh, of course enjoying retirement, and uh, I'll I'll get it to him. But sometimes he watches, but uh. There's a uh, Carl Toad Hamilton right there as well. I, I remember that? his face. I didn't know him that well, but I remember him. Um, Good guy, Artie Washington, if I'm not mistaken. Do you have a picture of me and Twiggy? Um, which one? Uh, uh, just me and Twiggy by ourselves. I don't think I do. No, sir. I'll have to look it up and send it to you. Okay, I've. I hate to say this. I don't think I've ever seen that photo. Actually, it's, either. A, it's like who's skinnier? Yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll be. I'll be anxious to see that one then. Um, oh, that's that's the rifle range. I can't believe you know that picture. I hate that picture too. That's the rifle range, you know. But you know, you're, uh, like that. Uh, I, I, that's a, uh, that's, that's a great shot there. I mean, that's why we all like, see, I, thank God y'all broke the rules and took photos because, uh, <laughs> uh, got your Rambo wrap on and, uh, ready to rock and roll there. Yeah. That was, that was pre Rambo, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah, it was. Yeah. It's, uh, that's anytime I see people do that on TV now, I'm like, Oh God, the, the saw guys were just so, so head, ahead of their time. Um, Someone's asking about gear now that we're on here. Uh, what Galil uh, wants to know: What was your favorite piece of uh, equipment, either weapon or gear-wise, that you used while you were with Sog? Well, uh, I, I liked my car, and I liked it, although I didn't have to use it uh, except for training purposes. It was my Swiss seat. You know what the Swiss seat is, right? Mm-hmm. It, it, it's a piece of rope that you fashioned into like a, a you know. A ball nut crash cruncher, you know, so you can be pulled out of the strings. I mean, I like having that just in case. But uh, um, yeah, my car, you know, there's a couple times like uh, when I uh, I was left on guard duty for the um, the uh, the airstrip there, just north of Docto or Playku. I think it was Docto actually. Um, I had a British stin gun one night. You know, oh lord! <laughs> and it, 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 I thought it was pretty cool, you know. <laughs> Oh yeah, very quiet and all that, but God forbid if you you ought to been overrun or you needed to take care of business and been stuck with the the sten gun all night. <laughs> yeah, I didn't know any better. <laughs> I just thought oh. it was cool. <laughs> oh yeah, it's definitely the cool factor, like the Swedish K. Love seeing y'all on the on the range with all y'all's uh 
stranger weapons and silenced weapons. Those are always good pictures. Um, where was one that I, someone was just asking? Ba, 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 ba. Oh, um, what was the large? Did, did you ever go on a heavy team, uh, or did you ever go on a super small team? What was the smallest uh, number or largest number you went out with? Oh, the smallest number was seven or eight, you know, and the largest was probably maybe nine, you know. So wow. I was always just a recon team, you know. Wow. So y'all uh, ever didn't ever try and pull a Joe Walker and uh, load up and and go out there and raise hell? <laughs> yeah, it was more. You know, Donny, Donny wouldn't let us carry claymores. Oh, wow. He didn't believe in them. He thought that if you put a claymore mine out there, that Charlie was going to sneak up at night and turn it around on your ass. I'm so, sure he's had, a, uh, he probably had some experiences with that in Delta, probably. Could have, man. Could have, but we never carried claymore, which, you know, I, you know at some point I was okay. I, I didn't have that extra weight there, you know. And wow, isn't okay. that crazy? After he ended up leaving, the Claymores are what pretty much saved uh, Dale and them's life after uh, c- keeping the NVA at bay when when Ken went down. Yeah, and uh, and and Donnie was no longer the one zero, you know. So uh, very very strange how that happens. Uh, yeah, uh, here was Thank one you. interesting, and I was wondering if you were actually on this one. Um that I'd forgotten about. Um, th- by this time, Master Sergeant Norm Donnie, one zero of RT Florida, nearly accomplished the feat. This is uh, guys mentioning uh, there for a while they had a dry streak, uh, dry spell on not getting any prisoners. And um, on May 11th, uh, RT Florida nearly accomplished this by disabling a lone NVA with a suppressed pistol he was preparing to hogtie the, the NVA until a uh, larger NVA unit appeared out of nowhere, launching RPGs uh, at Donny's Florida, RT Florida. That was not me. I wasn't on that one. I don't think. Um, the, yeah. Do you know what it's, month that was? May 11th. Of 69? Yes, sir. Then I had to be on it. I was about to say, I, I'm pretty <laughs> sure you were on that one. <laughs> you may have blocked that one out of your head. I could have, man, but yeah, I was, I was, I was with RT Florida till after uh, after Hawaii. You know. Okay. Wow. July. Jeez, I can, I can, I, I can picture Mr. Norm running out there and hog tying and looking up, and all of a sudden, here comes. A, a, a platoon diddy bopping right at y'all. Well, that's probably the one with the the POW. You know, mm-hmm. It could be but because I, I'll tell you yeah. too. Uh, the, that was the first time I ever heard F fours coming in. You know, laying down their their uh, you know their play playload or whatever it is, the payload. And uh, uh, I mean, it was so loud I fell on my knees because I never heard anything like that, and I just. I just fell on my knees, you know. And of course, my Vietnamese had a lot of fun with that one. Sergeant Morris, he hears the, he hears the planes and he falls to his knees and cries for his mama. <laughs> God, I can I could see that Give, giving you a hard time. Got to give you a hard time. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, you, as I said earlier, you were friends. Uh, friend, you are friends with Dave Gilmer and Mr. Richard Nowak. Um, uh. They they ended up guys breaking the uh, the dry spell for CCC by successfully getting a prisoner uh, for the first time in 1969. Uh, RT Texas. It had been eight months since Contum had gotten one. Uh, were you around? Uh, do you remember? Were you out in the field with Mister Norm, or do you remember that instance when they were bringing the uh, the prisoner in Texas and Mister Dave? Yeah, I I remember it happening. Uh... I think I was back that time. I was in the combo bunker, I believe. Um, I think there's some good photos. I need to look and see if your face is in there because there's a lot of guys out there. Let's see. Um, What was that like when when a team, not only because we see uh, teams coming in uh, sometimes and, you know, there'd be a larger than normal crowd, but usually teams are met 
what what was that like when either you get a team would get a POW uh, mm -hmm. or y'all would come back uh, from from nearly getting getting shot yeah. up or what, what was that like that feeling when the guys yeah. would be out there. When somebody came in with the POW, it, it's like that was the, the ultimate because that was what the mission was. More than anything, even though if you were doing BDAs or um, air reconnaissance, the whole idea was, if you could, was to get a prisoner. You know, bring it, bring them back, get the info and turn it into intelligence. Um, so it was always a buzz. When somebody heard about it, you know, because it passed through the camp like wildfire, you just ran right out to it, you know. So, and uh, conversely, when you heard somebody coming in and like they had, they had suffered some casualties and everything, it was also a little somber, you know. You know, I remember That's the time when Stubbs, you know, they never got, I don't think they ever got Stubbs' body, but before he ran out on the mission, he'd put a lot of money on the bar. So it was like, you know, that night everybody's in the bar drinking because old Bill Stubbs put up some money, you know. And, uh, that is a just a terrible, uh, a sad turn of events. Uh, uh, he was a, a good man, uh, Mr. Placer's friend and Captain David Carr's friend, uh, who was uh, for a short time at CCC as the recon C CO, and uh, that well, that's just a tragic story. The first time I knew about it, uh, you know, I forget where I was at, but I come out to, of the talk, I think, and I see, I don't know if you ever heard about Lieutenant Dennis, but Lieutenant Dennis was a good, good man, and I see he's crying openly. I said, what's going on? And he told me, and, uh, and how they, you know, they knew he was dead, but they had to declare him MIA because they couldn't get the body out, you know. And, uh, but the, yeah, Lieutenant Dennis, was, uh, uh, I'll never forget that sight. And it, I always felt like Lieutenant Dennis was a good, good man. He was, a, for an officer, he was a good guy. He's like Greg, you know, for an officer, he was good to be around. Yeah. Wow. I, I can't imagine what it was like for those guys that really loved, the, like you said, the good officers that really cared about y'all, what that must have been like with them having to sit there and doing all they can. And, you know, I, and like you said, you, you saw him crying that, that, that shows that it just eating them up inside. I, that's just yeah. Uh, yeah. amazing men. Uh, you know, they're doing all they can, but you know, sometimes sadly, you know, it, it doesn't matter. Um, a few questions about uh oh go ahead i'm sorry sidearm um oh i i didn't really have any preference on sidearm i was not a big weapons guy or anything like i never went hunting as a kid my dad was a hunter but he never took us out um so i wasn't a big hunter and didn't have a big uh i it just wasn't into weapons and stuff like that so my my favorite thing was that car 15 you know hey well how could it not be to be honest with you <laughs> Yeah, uh, I mean, it's a, it was so short, you know, I could use a bandana as the strap and I wouldn't get caught on the wait a minute bias or anything like that, you know. You could keep it in between the confines of your, your body, you know. Were, were you, uh, did you end up carrying a, a, probably 20 mags or so? How many, how many mags were you, would you carry uh, for operation? Well, like I said, I had four or a canteen covers, and I think I had six to eight magazines in each one. 28, you know, almost 30. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Good Lord. And you being 5'6", 120, good God almighty. <laughs> yeah. This is always an interesting one because I know y'all would stop when you could, but it was so dangerous. Um how much water would you carry initially on a on a on a mission? Well, I basically, uh, you know, I carried uh, a canteen and um, and um, lurps. Are you familiar with lurps? Uh, the know, ready the, the, the indigenous rations, the fish head and squid, and that kind of thing, mm -hmm. and rice. And uh, you could you could make that and keep it in your pocket, you know, down on your, your leg side pocket forever. And uh, um, and you know you had the uh, tablets, you know, to 
if you got water out of a stream, you know, you just put those tablets in there. Tablets on tablets. Right. Even if you felt some chunk go by you through your teeth, you knew at least it was it was safe to drink. <laughs> Great. I love that. Um, oh, wow. This is a really good question. I actually, I've never even asked you this. That's great. Um, what was the prize capture of intelligent treasure by you and your team or teams? Yeah, I, I don't think uh, we ever, at least the missions I ran, came across any intelligence other than what we would report back to, like, you know, uh, let's say we were doing a bomb damage assessment and come up on the Ho Chi Minh Trail, and there would be a big crater, right? Big crater right in the middle. But all around this crater was bamboo, you know, bamboo stakes all around it. So when the trucks would come down that, that Ho Chi Minh Trail, they would see that bamboo, and they knew to, to avoid the crater. Mm -hmm. uh, but no, never, I never found anything or, you know. I think one time I was really, you, you know that bandana I was wearing in that one picture? Well, I was like that, and uh, when we were not in triple canopy, man, my my head was getting baked, you know. And uh, uh, I saw this canister, and I put it on my head, and Sergeant Doney, yeah, <laughs> Sergeant Doney uh, uh, told me to take it off because he said that was a uh, uh, the canister for the part of a canister for uh, um, Agent Orange. Oh no, <laughs> no. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, and that picture that was that was actually in country. That was my first patrol. Oh wow! That wasn't across the fence. That was my first my first uh, in country patrol. Wow! Is this the same one with Ken, Mister Ken mm -hmm. Worley? Wow! Mm -hmm. Okay, amazing! Wow! That's uh, I got to be honest with you. Out of all of yours, that's my favorite photo of you. Well, my favorite photo. I wish I still had it, but uh, um, it was used in this. Uh, Thing, situation where you don't ever get your picture back, but it was right after I came back from a mission, and uh, uh, I don't have that thing on, but my face is all shooting, you know, from the uh, uh, from the, uh, the sweat and the uh, camouflage, you know, you know, melting, you know, and sitting there with my car 15, and just this little wry expression on my face. I wish I could have that picture to this day. Because that, that picture shows me uh, right after a mission, you know. Wow, man, I, I wish you did too. I, so I, I hate hearing about, that's like uh, uh, Mr. Greg, he, uh, you know, when he got injured, he never got to go back and get all of his photos. So someone ended up getting all of his photos and all of that. He he had a bunch of great stuff he, he never got to go back and get uh, that he's super bummed about. <laughs> Yeah. Um, let's see. Yeah. Uh, we've got a, a viewer that's finally caught us uh, live. Um, Clayton would like to know: ever mess with any C four? <laughs> well, yeah, we used to cook with it. You know, <laughs> back in, in training group before you know, before we graduated from Greenbury training, uh, uh, we'd be out in the field doing something, you know, and uh, well, we'd just tear off chunks of chunks of C four, you know, light it, you know. And, Cook your sea rations over it, but you never stomped it out. No, no. <laughs> Make yeah. your coffee, warm up food, and definitely but, uh, don't. I, I never did anything with it, like say you know, on a mission where you know you surreptitiously put it somewhere, you know, and get to blow it, you know, with the plastic cap. No, all I did with it was cook with it. Yeah. That I've uh, th there was a horror story of somebody cooking with some early on at uh, the the Christmas Eve party I think of '66 at FOB two uh, and some splash and some of the guys Squirrel Sprouse I think uh, and snake. Squirrel Sprouse and Dirty Ed Davis. Okay, you, you know that. Mates. Okay, and it. I don't it know if I know the car. story, but I don't know if I know the story, but I know you know it, Squirrel Sprouse some of it got in their coffee as they were going back from, from drinking all night and it got them sick as a dog. Someone found them passed out and thought they were drunk or may have died. And they finally figured out they had been cooking and were and figured out it was C4 and got them to the, the, the dispensary. And they had actually had to take them down to play coup because it was so bad, but 
they recovered and were back about a week later. <laughs> I never heard that story. Wow. Yeah, you got to be careful with your C4 when you're cooking with it, guys. Yeah, Make note. I guess so. <laughs> um, one of our viewers, uh, Jason, that's a good one I'll get into next. Uh, Wayne would like to know, uh, my dad was Army SF, though he has never talked about his time in Vietnam. I always wondered what makes you keep going on missions and what was the scariest mission you were on? Well, uh, Wayne, I can tell you, uh, I was scared every time. And I wasn't one of those guys that even though I, after running a few missions, I was one of those guys that said, okay, I want to keep doing this. I realized that, you know, I wasn't a bad soldier, but I wasn't really into doing what I was doing. So I decided to, after six months, I decided to go in and go into Camo and uh, uh, and try to make my way from there, uh, basically. So I was scared every time, but the, um, I, I, I was scared previous to going out. You know what I mean? You know, waiting for the choppers to get us and take us there. Once on the ground and running the mission, uh, I wasn't that scared at all. And I, that surprised me, actually. And, and it wasn't, I wasn't scared until after. You know, when I got back in the camp, I realized, man, I could have been killed, you know. And, and so I, it's what I was, and I never really thought about that too much, too much until maybe you just asked me that question because I, I can remember being real scared before I went on that. But once we were doing the mission and then the firefights, I don't remember being scared. I just remember wanting to get my shit out of there, you know, take care of business and get the hell out of there. But, uh, and I didn't get scared until I got back home, you know, uh, back at camp. And, uh, um, so uh, to be honest, I don't know what made those guys keep on going. Uh, a, they were really into it and B, they did it for the country, which is, uh, uh, I have to say, I didn't have that esteemed uh, outlook. Uh, not, I love my country. I just wasn't a hero, you know. When then, you know, I, if I could go somewhere safe, I want to go somewhere safe, you know. Well, I you're like you're a definitely a hero. You you definitely a hero. You cut yourself yeah. short way too much, sir. But uh, you you were smart enough to realize you you were big, you were pushing the envelope way too much, and and realize you needed to to call it quits before you got hurt and you got your team hurt by not wanting to be out there. So, yeah. Um, well, I hope Wayne, uh, is his dad still with us? Uh, Wayne. Um, he was thanking us for your, he said, thank you for your service. Wayne, is your father still with us? Uh, if so, let us know, uh, on here. Um, Galil, absolutely. Yeah. He absolutely is a hero. Uh, I tell him that he's very humble and doesn't like to admit it, but he absolutely is. Um, is it true there ain't no atheists in a foxhole? Just kidding, little joke. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's probably true. That's probably true. You know, I, I don't. Uh, well, what was that question? You can go ahead. I I went way too quick. If you were saying something right then. Oh uh, uh, no, uh, just. Uh, um, I've always had, uh, like, I've always admired people like Dale who have so much commitment in their faith. And, uh, uh, and I know that, uh, that the Lord has probably helped me out, but I, I just, I don't know if I see the Lord the same way as a lot of people do. I, uh, and I still struggle with that in some ways and stuff, but, the, um, but yeah, um, so, and I'll leave it at that, you know. Everybody's got their their own way of uh, of of dealing with the uh, the big man in the sky, however you see him. So, you know, that's 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 it. Um, a few of them are kind of going back in time. Wait, let me make sure I'm not jumping the timeline here. Bup, 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 bup. Sorry about. Oh, here we go. Here's one that's before we jump back in time. Uh. Did y'all use? I don't know if y'all using lights. Did y'all use lights out in the field? And if so, did never. you ever have to? Never, never, never had a fly. I don't think I carried one even. That's yeah. what I was thinking. I was about and to say. I, and, I, and the only the only knife I had was a, a Swiss Army knife. <laughs> you know, I didn't have a big old machete or anything like that. You know, I just 
I was going to cut something. I was going to be real quiet. <laughs> hey, you, you really couldn't have picked a better knife. I mean, you got something for, for all occasions there. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, wait, okay, I'm missing out on it. <laughs> um, we've got a few dealing with base the base life coming up. Um, did you see any fist fights at the FOB, or did never. you take play? No, never. You know why? Because everybody was into each other, mm -hmm. and that's, mm -hmm. I never even thought about that till I just saw that question. But never saw a fight, never. I've uh, I've brought up one that 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 I've I've told, and of course Mike Shepard was involved. Uh, uh -oh. he uh. Well Go yeah. <laughs> <Bless you>. uh, <laughs> he uh he, he had been uh at Doc Siang as I mentioned and um ended up uh being shot down and and right there outside the wire and and saving everyone uh him and another guy getting getting everybody in the wire and all that and uh he crossed paths with an officer that was you know trying to play medic if you will and act like he was in it and helping and everything and Next thing you know, uh, a week or so later, he's uh, at the club going to meet Bob Howard, and the officer walks in for some reason. He may have been with the Mike Force or what have you, but he walked in, and uh, Mike had uh, said if he sees him again, he's going to let him know because he put himself in for a silver star and got it. And uh, Mike walked up to him and knowing certain terms so I don't get in trouble let him know that he was a part of the female anatomy. And if he doesn't get out of the club, he's going to have an issue. And he laughed at Mike and Mike commenced to wail on him. And uh, he walked out or crawled out, I should say, came back with a 45, cocked it, put it to uh, Mike's face in between his eyes. And thank goodness Bob Howard was in the bathroom and was walking back into the main bar area and walked up behind him, tapped him on the shoulder, and laid him out. Gun goes off, and that's the last of it. So Mike digs the bullet out, makes a necklace, and gives it to Bob for him to wear for saving his life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Mike, like I said, I was with him in the training group, and then later on there, but, uh, but uh, um, yeah. Like, He's the only like, man I know that's ever had that 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 I know of that's been in a fight at the at the at FOB two. Uh, yeah, that, that, um, that's the only one. Well, if it was gonna be anybody, it'd be him, but uh, it was for a good cause. And it would, and, and there to clarify, like you said, it was not a fellow Sog man either. So right, exactly. Yeah, Each I, both times. So go figure. I also, remember, uh, I don't remember. Um, but no, I, I never saw a fight ever. No. I can see everybody getting a little rowdy every one uh, once in a while, but I, I, other than that, I've not heard of of people getting too out of control. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, no, nah, it was it, it was too much of a brotherhood. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, it's it's like brotherly pranks, but nothing more than that, you know. Um, BF, I feel like CCC's AOs had some of the most interesting terrain in that tri-border area. Obviously, I've never been, but from my reading and listening, it seems like more coverage, easier to conceal movement. Uh, yeah, yeah, uh, I'd have to agree with that. The only other place I saw that was like just as bad was uh, actually in the, uh, North Carolina, if I can say that. Uh, uh, the, uh, the Pisgah National Forest and uh, Davy Crockett, some of the underbrush there was, I mean, I had more weight in minute vines in there than I did in Vietnam. Uh, uh, of course, it's my first experience with that situation, but uh, um, but yeah, it was easy to conceal. And that's the whole thing. You could sit there as a seven man team, lay still, and people would walk right by you and they'd never know you're there until somebody sneezes, coughs, or whatever, yeah. Uh, we've got the son of a SOG man, uh, Jason Damoth. Uh, he's thanking you for your service. His father was at uh, CCS and CCC, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, I believe so. Jay, I'm sorry, uh -huh. my brain's not working. I've got so much going on. But uh, his his father was Jack Damoth. Um, I don't know if you may have heard of him, but I think it was a little after your time, actually. 
Um, well, uh, thank him for his service. And I'll tell you, uh, Jason, it, uh, when, when people started thanking me for my service, I had a hard time accepting that, you know, because for 50 years, nobody said nothing. I didn't say nothing. That's partly why I'm, I'm glad y'all are agreeing to do this because all of us appreciate uh, not only y'all taking the time to speak to us, but share stories and, and answer the viewer questions. Because uh, like I told the guys and the viewers, you know, uh, I, I've been lucky enough to be able to speak to y'all and, and get to call or email when I, when I have questions and all that. And it, it just means, uh, the world just you know to for y'all to interact with the community and and uh we we definitely appreciate y'all service uh and i i hate it's taking so long for people to be so interested in y'all but better late than never as as i can say because y'all are rock stars now to us well uh, i don't know about that but hey man, <laughs> if i can can i tell you the story about that red guitar over there oh absolutely I oh walking, yes, yes. I was walking across the compound, and I hear this guy singing a song, playing. I could hear the guitar, and he's uh, singing one, two, three, four. What are we fighting for? Don't ask me. I don't give a damn. My next stop is being there. And that's like Dixon the Die Rag by Country Joe and the Fish. Well, this guy, because I, I went right into his suit, and said, "Man, that's cool." And he said, "Well, that's." He said, "I love that song." I said, "You know, that's a protest song, right?" He said, no, no, no. I thought that was a pro-war song. <laughs> <laughs> but I bought the guitar off him the next day. That's a Gibson J45, and I bought it for $150. Now, oh, my God. That that doesn't sound like much. And I can't believe I had $150, but I did, American. And But I, I, I Googled it not too long ago, and so $150 of 1969 was like $1,100 today. I, I I was about to say, I mean, that, that is a lot of money for you to be spending, but I mean, that is a heck of a guitar also. I mean, that, I hope you don't ever get rid of that thing. I mean, that is a. Oh man, I've, I've hitchhiked across the country with that guitar, but I've, I've hitchhiked through snow and rain and sleep with that guitar, man. And it's a, no, I'll, I'll never get rid of that guitar. That, that is so amazing that you were able to get that thing home in one piece and it's still well, in such funny pristine. you say that because there was a couple other guys who had guitars like that and they got shrapnel in them. Ah. Oh. <laughs> but mine didn't. <laughs> Thank the Lord. Man, that is ah, oh, I remember that and uh Country Joe and the Fish sitting there playing Country yeah. Joe and don't even know it's a protest song. <laughs> yeah. I love that. Yeah. Be the first hell, he was on your at, block to have your boy come home in a box. Know, yeah, he uh, hell he was at uh uh at Woodstock playing it. That was a yeah a, a, yes, a great was. set. Uh, yeah. I think his guitarist Barry Melton was a vet, if I'm not mistaken. I have to look and see, but <laughs> that, I bet you're right because I know that name Barry Melton, and that's probably where I know it from. Yeah. His, I believe his name, uh, his nickname is inspired the Country Joe and the Fish. They called him Fish. If I'm not mistaken, oh, is that right? Mm -hmm. okay. Guys, if y'all don't know Country Joe, go go look up Country Joe. I feel like I'm fixing to die, and a song called "Not So Sweet Lorraine." Uh, it'll be life changing, I assure you. Um, <laughs> we've got a few more questions here. We've had you two hours, sure. and I uh, I know uh, that's a long time, and it's getting late. Um, oh. Before I go back in time, I, somebody just had a great one come up here, right, uh, right here. Um, two actually. <laughs> Did you ever hear any of any accidents, any self-inflicted wounds at the club, or guys messing around cleaning weapons? Well, um, I don't. There may have been something like it, but I don't think so. I don't remember. The, you know, it was all volunteer outfit. You know, for the most part, except for the guys who were like stationed there for administrative purposes, you know, and stuff like that. And, or, or cooks and stuff. Um, but no, I never heard of anything or anybody, you know, you know, one of the cool thing was, um, I mean, everybody, one of the coolest things I can remember is like, after I went to the combo bunker, um, 
Miller. Miller comes down into the bunker where we're doing the uh, uh, teletype thing, you know, doing the teletype. And uh, uh, he comes down there and he starts talking. And you can tell this guy has been getting high for a while, you know. And, but he was just so cool. He didn't care who you were or anything. He talked to you, you know, and uh, uh, he was, he, he, but he was typically, and I don't know where he's from, but if I had to guess, I'd say he was a California guy because that's the way, that's the way he seemed, you know. And uh, I was so bummed to hear that he passed away a while back, and the, uh, you know, because he was to me, he was, a, and the, the rumor is that you know when he got his uh, uh, CMH that he actually smoked he, weed down in the basement of the White House. You know? He did. I don't know if that's true or not, but that was the that was the scuttlebutt. He, he did. I've got a uh, very good, uh, very good authority uh, that that he did, and they actually he conceded. Uh, he had his earrings in, and he did concede and take those off. But he did, in fact, uh, get back at them by uh, sparking one down uh, in the in the bowels of the White House. <laughs> <laughs> what a guy i i if y'all guys if i've got the book in there because i'm actually uh, about to reread it but if you don't have it it's called reflections of a warrior and it is a outstanding book he uh spent four years or so in vietnam and it is a outstanding book just out oh, did he write a book he did, did Miller... yes sir oh okay mm -hmm. what reflections of a warrior i'm gonna have to look for that one I'll uh, I'll send you a link on Am uh, through Amazon so you can you can find it. It's a, okay, a wonderful great. wonderful book. Um, someone was asking before we go back to those last two. Let me find it. I apologize, guys. Um, oh, Jason said yes. CCC, CCS, and CCC. He was camo and light weapons. He was uh, okay. Very good man. Yeah, uh, I've heard we've spoken to a lot of men that knew his father and he was a outstanding man and an outstanding soldier. Always glad when Jason's watching, he's a good guy himself. Um, okay. Galil, I know you asked something about some creepy crawlers and I'm trying to find it, <laughs> uh, because that's always guaranteed for a good one. Um, Oh, there it is. Um, what was the spookiest mission in snog, uh, snog, Sog, uh, did you see the snake people, that mysterious uh, cannibal tribe, uh, rock apes, tigers, snakes, anything like that? No, man, I never saw a snake, never saw, I saw a orangutan, I think, one time, I saw an orangutan, and, uh, uh, and I want to say, and I, I know there's probably contradictory thoughts, but I, I know that I heard the fuck you, Lizard. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. and oh yeah. Some people say it was a bird, but I think I found out later that it's actually a lizard. It most certainly is. There's uh in one Jason's new book, uh Hardy, he's got a little special on the uh FU lizards and little tiny yeah. things and they uh they Boy, they were loud though. Oh yeah. I, and you don't think something that small can create that much noise. It is unbelievable. <laughs> um there's actually some good sounds of it, guys, on YouTube. If you'd like to actually hear what it sounds like, it there it's clear as day, and it's on YouTube. Um, I'll never forget what it sounds like. I was about to say, you don't need to go back and listen. <laughs> um, Jason has two dealing with around the base. Uh, can you uh, – do you have any funny stories or stories about what life was other than your awesome guitar story about what – day-to-day -day life was at the at the base when you weren't on a mission yeah i mean uh okay you see those guitars back there and uh we'd get drunk up when we'd have floor shows these filipino girls you know uh uh playing guitars and singing and they sounded great and stuff like that but we'd always get drunk and take over and grab the guitars and stuff and the drums and i was terrible i didn't know i could count to four but i can't get there at the same time you would and uh and the, I, I can still remember seeing, like, looking down at Carol Ass, and he had the dirtiest look on his face. <laughs> we were so bad. I was so bad. But, uh, um, um, yeah, the day-to-day -day life was uh, uh, really, I mean, just it, was just, it never got boring, you know what I mean? It never got boring. There was always a story. Somebody's always coming back. But uh, um, I remember one time, 
okay, uh, coming out of the club in the mess hall, uh, the, uh, the beautification project went on. So uh, to line along the sidewalks, they took to put up these little bamboo things. They had like little things like that and a bamboo going across. And it was about ankle high all the way around the sidewalk. Well, one time we all of a sudden we hear incoming and everybody jumps up from the club in the mess hall there and starts running out. And 30 people got tripped up by those bamboo things. They rolled, crawled out and stuff like that. And by the time we make it to the bunker, you know, I was scared, you know, and, uh, Sergeant Howard comes by and he's running and directing everybody. And I said, Sergeant Howard I said, is the FOB getting hit? And he said, no, God damn it, we're getting hit. <laughs> 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 and actually what it was was short rounds. It was actually oh. fire. Oh but Lord. That beautification program went right to the you know, that was it. It was they were done with that. <laughs> Nobody thought about anything like that, you know, that Oh, this might trip people. You know, they come running out. <laughs> like a Monty Python movie. Huh? Just, oh, my do, 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 do. oh, man. I needed that. That was good. Um, let's see. Uh, we've got a few pictures to close it out, but here's one more. Uh, Jason was wondering, do you have any training group stories or do you remember any notable instructors that you have. Yeah, I do. And uh, one of them involved uh, Alan Farrell and me and a guy oh, named Lord. Jeff Miller. And it was our combo, the phase two part of it. And uh, Al Farrell came up with the, uh, the, the sergeant was a sergeant Brophy and the, uh, the lieutenant was a lieutenant uh, 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 Oh, uh, I Duffy, Lieutenant Duffy, and of course Alan, Alan wrote on the wall of the, you know, the, on the stone, you know, Brophy, uh, uh, Duffy has stuffed me, but Brophy is no trophy, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then uh, uh, one time I was doing the uh, laundry, I was in Company B, I was doing laundry down in the basement, you know, they get the washing machine dryer, and I'm sitting there doing laundry, and then in comes a uh, Captain Brook. Captain Brook was this commanding officer of a company B. And he looks at me and said, what are you doing here? I said, I'm doing laundry. He said, no, I mean, what are you doing here? I said, well, I'm doing laundry. He said, no, what are you doing here? This is a military base installation. I said, well, I'm going to training group. And he thought I was a boy scout or something because I was oh. so little and so young. And I said, what are you doing here? <laughs> Captain Barry Brunk. <laughs> the one time, I come out in the formation. Of course, we could run into formation from uh, from the mess hall, and I'm putting on my wet belt. You know, you're in a hurry. And when I stand at attention, and I think I don't remember this lieutenant's name, although I can still see his face. He comes, looks right at me, says, "Pretty funny, huh, Morris?" And I said, "What do you mean?" And he says, I'm "Sorry, sir." And he takes and undoes the cap of my canteen because I had it on upside down, and the water just poured all over my leg. You know, of course. And then one more time, like we had this, we had this thing called ghosting. If you could ghost and not be in the first formation, you could kind of chill out the whole day because they didn't know where you were, or what you were doing. So a lot of us would get under our bunks. Well, bless his heart, we had this guy named Henry, and he he got under his bunk, but his bunk happened to be facing the door. So when somebody walked in the doorway, they could see him under his bunk. <laughs> Yeah, I, <laughs> I'm wondering if uh uh Jeff Miller, I'm wondering if that was Brock How if Nick Brockhausen's buddy that writes with him, his partner. I understand uh that uh uh I I saw something where uh, um where I, I came across Jeff, Jeff, and it was like a video clip or something like that. They were being interviewed for about some stuff that, that they had written and did or something like that. And I didn't know who the other guy was, but I, I knew Jeff Miller, L.A. boy, you know. Th uh, that's, that's him and uh, Nick Brockhausen from CCN. That is so wild. Wow. I, that's yeah, definitely after, Jeff. After, uh, uh, after that, you know, the, the Phase 2 mission with Jeff, I never heard from him again until – and talking to uh, Al Farrell, um, 
apparently he had gotten with Jeff in LA to help train some police cadets or something like that, you know. Mm-hmm. And that, that was first that was just a year or so ago, and that's the first I've heard about Jeff Miller since then. I believe he uh he did a uh I'm not meaning this derogatory. I think he had a regular uh, SF experience. Uh, a team. I think he did an A team tour. Uh, as yeah, and that's nothing. Bonus. Nothing. No. Uh, you know, I have some friends that were on A teams, and they saw some shit, boy. Oh, you know, oh, yeah. Getting uh, getting hit, you know, you know, a lot. Getting hit a lot. It, I uh, and and a lot of the guys, uh, people are asking me, you know, besides y'all that come straight in, a lot of the 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 early SOG men and even some later on, a lot of them were either Mike Force or either had a team experience. Like uh, right. Mike Shepard being one. Mike Shepard went to a A camp first, came back and uh, went to the Hatchet Forces and then recon. So. It, it's definitely no joke doing a, a an, an A team stand in Vietnam at all. No, no, man. Um, I'm glad I went where I went. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, and another uh, weird thing you mentioned, uh, Lieutenant Duffy. I'm wondering if that w- was going to be. Thinking, I don't know if the name was Duffy or Luffy. Okay. Uh, if it was, I'm wondering if that could have been uh, Captain John Duffy that went and was in Sog. Uh, could have been. Could have been. I, I, um, I was sitting there I couldn't remember the name of Luffy or Duffy. Um, we've got a few closing ones, little tidbits, and I'll we'll t- uh, I'm gonna show some pictures and we'll close it up for the night at two hours here, or we're at two hours now. Um, yeah, I didn't think see. we were gonna get through thirty minutes. I told you once it got going, you, you, we've got a uh, 36 act, active viewers right now and commenters, so I I told you it'd kick up. Um. Did you have any co- collaboration with uh, Navy SEALs while you were in Vietnam? Only in the, uh, the t- training group situation, um, they were they would just, there was two Navy SEALs guys that came with us in training, and uh, I'm thinking I, I wasn't the O five B the communication thing was I think it was in phase three. But these guys were the <clears throat> forerunners of, you know, two guys that were built like brick shit houses and, and very big. And, <clears throat> you know, you, you knew that they're, they could, they could hold your breath for an hour and a half. You know what I mean? They're that kind of guys and stuff. And they were very, very cool. Um, <clears throat> but to them, nothing overseas, but definitely in, in the training group. Trying to see here we've had a bunch of uh we've got a sog man son uh his father was moose gross uh he uh yes uh we were talking about mr delima earlier on uh and uh, gosh very actually a few times mr bill came up um uh, did you happen to know his uh his dad moose gross uh i think he was at ccn no he was at ccn with rt new jersey i'm sorry uh, I got that mixed up. Um, let me see here. Ba, ba, ba. Yeah, uh, when I uh, uh, I ran into Lima, I was just coming back from somewhere, and he was getting on the plane to go back to the states. And this is 1969, okay. And when he saw me, he gave me a hug that was the biggest hug I'd ever received by a man in my entire life. He was so full of life and so full of love basically but from that mission that we were on i mean he just gave me the biggest hug and i I was not freaked out but i was just like wow i was overwhelmed by it you know (laughs) he had that much emotion you know i've i've heard he was such a such a good man another uh native hawaiian uh like like glenn uh i've I've heard he's was just a, a a great great guy um, yeah, yeah Scott was, uh, said uh, he was an awesome man. Scott uh, was special forces. He followed his uh, fo- in his father's footsteps, and he knows a lot of of you guys through his father. His father was quite the man. Uh, actually, he was at CCC. He I forgot he was on the Halo Jump with Howard Sugar and R.T. Washington. Uh, oh, Mr. Really? Gross was yes, yes, sir. His wow. father was quite the stud. 
Um, wow. <clears throat> well, let me show these pictures, and if I come across any fo- uh, any of the questions I missed, I'll go over them. Um, if you would, that is one of the funniest <laughs> ones I think you've ever ever shown me or taken. <laughs> well, you know where that comes from, right? Uh, from Greg Glasshauser actually did that to Major League. He took a cigar, a cigar of a cigarette out of Major Leaf's mouth and put put it out on his forehead. And Major Leaf had that, you know, that burn mark for the longest time. But but that's what that's from. That's him grabbing me. And this this is that same New Year's Eve thing. Oh Lord, yeah. So that that is that's probably a little later on in the night after even a few more beverages have been. Uh, it could be, man. I don't know what part of the night it was. <laughs> I love that. The major leads. I mean, that shows in Sog how uh, how close y'all were, and I mean, like a family. They're a a a a, a, a field officer messing around, reenacting where he got burned with a cigar. With right. were you a were you a sergeant at that time, or were you a, a yeah yeah okay yeah. a lowly sergeant? I was an E five. Yeah. <laughs> oh gosh. Uh, and uh, the major is still with us, y'all. I've uh, made contact with him. He uh, is a very, very good man. Very good man. Yeah. Um. Let's see here. I don't actually know when this one was from. I remember showing this to you a while back, and I think this was at Contum. Oh, yeah. That's when I got – that's probably uh, October of, uh, of 69. That's when – you, you're kind of cutting it off, but underneath, I'm pushing my arm out like that because I just gotten promoted to sergeant and I had the the sergeant stripe show, you know, sewn on. So I was actually showing off my uh, uh, sergeant stripe. <laughs> showing off that promotion, okay. Yes, sir. Wow, that's a great I'm photo. So glad to be at E5 as a, you know, a sergeant buck sergeant as opposed to being a specialist. <laughs> Uh, oh, wow. Um, Jason, it's Major Leets, L-E-I-T-E-S, if I'm not mistaken. Right. Um, Scott says he actually has uh, the patch that Major Leech was wearing. Uh, oh, that's the, uh, that the, uh, the Vietnamese. Uh, um, the Sioux patch, I think. Yeah. yeah. Special Commando unit. Um, yeah. I'll look his name up. Yeah, Clayton. I'm not sure which guest it was uh, that looked like Heisenberg. Maybe someone can tell me. Uh, I've had so many guys on, I can't remember uh, who looked like uh, Heisenberg from Breaking Bad. Uh, Scott's father was actually in JSOC at CCC and CCN during Vietnam. So, Or JSOC after, of course, but CCC and CCN during what, Vietnam. What is JSOC? Joint Special Operations Command. Oh, okay. I've got one of those hats, actually. My brother uh, got it for me. It, well, it says uh, uh, Special Operations Command. It's down there in Florida, there's a military base there that Air Force and Army mixed together, I think. Oh, yeah. McDill yeah. or something like that? Uh, it is McDill, I believe, is where JSOC is. Uh, maybe yeah. Scott can let us know. I'm, uh, I'm not good with any of it. I've got the history of JSOC in there that I've got to read, but I keep getting new SOG books and Vietnam books and I will never be making my way out of Vietnam. <laughs> uh, oh yeah, it probably was Leon Sonnenberg. Jason, thank you. Uh, I didn't even notice that he may have looked like uh, <laughs> I love that, uh, the Daffy Duck thing there, by the way. It's, it's pretty funny. That's that funny. is his uh, his mugshot picture. Uh, it wasn't <laughs> McDill, JSOC. All right, great. Um, I believe we have hit our questions here. Um, everyone is saying thank you for stopping by and, and speaking with us. Um, is there, uh, anything before, wait, we've had one, um, no, we've already questioned that one. That one's pretty much answerable and know how to do that one. Um, is there anything you'd like to, to close out with, well, first off, uh, before, as you're closing out, w- w- when did you officially leave Vietnam and did you stay in or did you retire? No, I did not. Um, actually, I extended and normally you had to extend for six months or three months or something like that. 
but uh, I heard that the army came out with something where like, if you got back to the United States and you had 150 days or less to serve, you got an automatic discharge. So I extended 65 days so that when I hit the States, you know, um, I, uh, I got an immediate discharge. Wow. And one, th- one thing I will say is that when you got discharged back then, that was it. They just let you go. There was no debriefing or anything like that, you know. And I am currently, uh, uh, I have been in counseling with a bunch of the Vietnam vets and some, uh, uh, you know, um, the Iraqi war vets and stuff like that. And mostly it's a bunch of old men just shooting shit. But the, it's actually been very good therapeutic for me. And uh, um, um, so I'm glad to have that. Uh, I, I, did, I resisted it doing it at first and stuff. But the, uh, when I finally went to one meeting, uh, I realized, man, the cool thing is that these guys know what you've been through. You know, your wife doesn't even know what you've been through, you know. So I do that, and I'm glad I do that. So, so uh, you ended up, as you've kind of alluded to a few times, you've uh, you did or not, uh, you did go to college, and then you've been involved uh, with music, or did you uh, not go back yeah. to college after? I, I, w- I went to college, and I, before I went to the army, I went to high state university, but I probably flunked out because I didn't know how to study or anything like that. So when I got back from Vietnam and I, I applied to go back to, to Ohio State, they wouldn't let me in. I had to go prove myself. So I went to a went to a junior college, got good grades and stuff, and then I hope they probably let me back in. But by that time, I don't know where what I was doing or whatever. I was smoking pot, you know, and uh, and I just didn't know what I wanted to do. When I heard these people saying they were uh, um, majoring in business, that sounded like the stupidest thing to me. Which actually, that was very smart on their part. So I, I actually hitchhiked all around the United States. I hitchhiked from Ohio to California, uh, Ohio to Colorado and back. And back in those days, you could do that. And uh, sometimes I was by myself, sometimes I was with a friend or even a girlfriend, believe it or not. But uh, um, I found myself tending bar right across the street from Ohio State University. And as I was tending bar, uh, this band started playing there. And so I just started helping them out every once in a while. And then uh, uh, they got a chance to open up for it, for a, an act I want to talk about. But the, um, I just found myself in that world where all of a sudden we're opening up for Charlie Daniels and the Allman Brothers and things like that, because it was a pretty good band. And I realized, okay, this is something I can dig because I didn't like going into the same place to work every day. I just wasn't fit for a nine to five. So I found myself going on the road 200 and some days out of the year, you know. And back in the day when I started it, I wasn't riding on some luxurious bus. I was driving the, 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 the crew truck, you know. But uh, um, so I started uh, working with bands and uh, from L.A. And, you know, eventually I was on the MC Hammer tour and working with people like that. And, uh, um, you know. For since 1977, that's the only thing I've ever done is just go on the road. And at 75 years old, I'm I'm still going on the road, but not as much as I used to, which is all right by me. But I still like getting on that bus and going through the dark American nighttime while people are sleeping, and I'm on a bus going to my next gig. You know. And wow! Uh, Turned into a road uh, warrior. It sounds like. Uh, yeah, pretty much, man. And I'm this week. I'm going to be in South Carolina this week. You know. And uh, the guy I work with now, he's been, he does the Grand Ole Opry all the time. And, you know, we've been, I've been on tour with a bunch of big acts and stuff. And, uh, oh, yeah. But, uh, um, uh, you know, I like the road life. I, you know, it's just all there's to it. It's, you know, that's why I probably didn't get married until I was 61, because uh, uh, my girlfriends at the lodges couldn't put up, didn't, you know, didn't want to be with somebody that was always gone all the time, you know? So. Wow. And you've, uh, like you said, you've crossed paths with some very, very uh, famous musicians and uh, oh, definitely yeah. crossed paths with one of my all time favorites. Uh, as you can tell on the poster back there on the wall. Wait, there we go. Yep. And by my 
Grateful yep. Dead tattoo. He's met Jerry Garcia, and I will uh, for always be jealous of that. Uh, that's uh, a few well, times I, actually. Yeah, you know, I, I mean it. Crazy. In fact, we you know we may have to have you on here one time to just talk about music because uh, we've got a, quite a few followers that are music fans also, uh, and especially with you being in Vietnam and being after Vietnam and music, we we could talk about Vietnam music one day, but um. Uh, do you have anything else that you'd like to say and, uh, go over before we close out for the evening? Well, I'm, I'm like I said, I was surprised that we could talk for this long about my experiences. Uh, um, I really appreciate the people that have tuned in on this and, uh, blown away by some of them that his, you know, fathers were actually in the same thing and, and, uh, so this has been a you know a good experience for me and uh, eye opening as well. And, uh, I appreciate your interest. Uh, we I, I told you uh, from from the get go. Uh, you know you might as well space out some time uh, because it ain't no way this thing will stop at thirty minutes. Uh, it, it 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 it'll it'll go on and we could probably keep going on and on, but. Uh, we just, uh, I mean, there are a bunch of stuff coming in saying just absolutely respect and thank you for coming on and uh, sharing your story. Uh, that That's what we're very appreciative of because we know some vets, uh, we've hit the wall on some that uh, are open to, to speak privately with me and stuff like that, which I have to honor, but they don't feel like coming on here. So anytime we can get someone uh, and especially someone that, the wider community may not know about. Uh, that's what I'm trying to do is is get men that aren't marquee names, if you will, to, to come on. And you, even though you're a marquee name in my book, uh, I, 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 I love having y'all on here. It's been uh, the, the best five or six years of my life getting to speak to you gentlemen and, and finally have y'all on here. So I thank you for spending two hours with us tonight and answering all these questions. And uh, maybe we can have you on if you can bear with us again and come back. We'd love to have you back on sometime. Well, thank you very much. And I'd be honored. Absolutely. All righty. Well, uh, guys, we've hit the two hours and 15 minute mark and I will wow. pass along your messages and, and hellos and goodbyes and uh, hope everyone has a good night and uh, we're going to shut it down. Um, I'll end it, and if you want to, uh, whenever we shut down, Mr. Joe, you can uh, hit leave studio, but I'm about to uh, end it right now here in just a second. Guys, we'll okay, see you man. later, and uh, Mr. Joe, I will be in touch with you later on. All right. Thanks, bud. You have a good evening. You too. See you later. All right, guys. Uh, this was absolutely an awesome show. I knew Joe was going to be great. Uh, I'm sorry it took so long, but, uh, you know, what's the old adage, uh, good things are worth waiting on. And, uh, there you go. You, Mr. Joe is very humble. As you can tell, he, uh, he, he still doesn't think he did that much running re only, uh, six or seven recon missions and then, uh, the local patrols and stuff like that. Uh, that's just utter nonsense in my book, uh. If you cross the fence once, you're you're a hero. If you even served in in the military uh, overseas, you're a hero in my book. And uh, I'm I'm just glad we got to have Joe on here and have him share and let him share what he's been telling me and the stuff I've been hearing these past two or three years. Uh, getting to know him, he uh, absolutely Clayton. One mission is is insane. Um, so thank you all for the great questions tonight. We I think tonight was probably one of the best episodes we've ever done. Guest-wise, interaction-wise, um, just absolutely knocked it out of the park. Jason, Panama Brad, Clayton, BF, um, <clears throat> Scott, glad you, you got in even though it was late. Um, Galil, uh, wonderful stuff today, man. Um, who am I forgetting? Jake, God, glad you made it as well, brother. Um, Red, nice to see you, man. Uh, haven't seen you in a while. Uh, Wayne, all of y'all, just thank you. Thank you so much for, for participating and make Mr. Joe feel as good as he did. Uh, it, I, I get calls the next day or text after we go off and 
telling me how much it, it means to them that they were able to, uh, to talk and that we took so much of an interest in it. To, uh, so it, it means a lot to them. And it means a lot to me too for, for y'all uh, participating like y'all do. So we've uh, got a big week as Jason was alluding. Um, tomorrow morning I speak to Bill DC uh, that you would have heard from, uh, that you heard mentioned from our last episode with Leon Sonnenberg. Um, we'll see about getting him on. But I also run a test with Frank Doherty, whose book is out, SPAF Pilot, um, Phil uh, Counts, SPAF Pilot, and Mike Buckland, RT R- R- Main, and then the backseater for uh, uh, Phil and for Frank. Uh, so I'll be testing that, and we've still got to get Don Fulton on with Terry. So we will be having a multi-guest show, uh, maybe one this week and one next week, or maybe two next week. Uh, but Friday, we have Ed Walkoff uh, doing specific mission stories, uh, i.e. his coldest to hottest. Um, and then he'll talk about, yep, uh, Ford Drum, a lot of Ford Drum talk from uh, Bucky and Frank. Uh, but uh, uh, gosh, Ed will be talking about what it's like leading a team as a 1-0 in a hot mission. What's it like being a 1-1 uh, under one zero that that's learning the ropes. It's, it's going to get very, very, very in depth, uh, with Ed. I've got the show notes and Jason's got some of them that he's going to put some details out on his Twitter. Um, and Thursday tomorrow, no Thursday, two days from now, uh, I will be having James Stetchskull on from, uh, debt a and, uh, also when he worked with JSOC also. Um, so we've got a big rest of the week and next week we'll be big with, uh, alert and Ranger, um, Gary Linder. And let me just go ahead and flip the notes pad up and look. And, uh, we've got, um, Mike. Oh, Mike Vining from Delta. God, I forgot about that, guys. Yes, we will be having Mike Vining from Delta on ne- uh, November 9th. Uh, that's going to be great history of EOD and uh, his Delta career. So we've got a huge next two weeks up. So I uh, I appreciate uh, Clayton. Yeah, wish I had a huge uh, bank account, too. I'd still be buying books, too. I'm in debt from these. But uh, without further ado, I'm going to call it a night. Thank you, guys. Uh, I'll let jo- uh, Joe know how, how well it went. Um, this was great. Um, y'all have a safe night and a wonderful night, and I will talk to you all in the morning through Instagram or Twitter. So see you all later, guys. Have a good night.